This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Man's Search for Himself by Rollo May. Narrated by James Anderson Foster. Preface One of the few blessings of living in an age of anxiety is that we are forced to become aware of ourselves. When our society, in its time of upheaval in standards and values, can give us no clear picture of what we are and what we ought to be, as Matthew Arnold puts it, we are thrown back on the search for ourselves. The painful insecurity on all sides gives us new incentive to ask, is there perhaps some important source of guidance and strength we have overlooked? I realize, of course, that this is not generally called a blessing. People ask, rather, how can anyone attain inner integration in such a disintegrated world? Or they question, how can anyone undertake the long development toward self-realization in a time when practically nothing is certain, either in the present or the future? Most thoughtful people have pondered these questions. The psychotherapist has no magic answers. To be sure, the new light which depth psychology throws on the buried motives which make us think and feel and act the way we do should be of crucial help in one's search for oneself. But there is something in addition to his technical training and his own self-understanding which gives an author the courage to rush in where angels fear to tread and offer his ideas and experience on the difficult questions which we shall confront in this book. This something is the wisdom the psychotherapist gains in working with people who are striving to overcome their problems. He has the extraordinary, if often taxing, privilege of accompanying persons through their intimate and profound struggles to gain new integration. And dull indeed would be the therapist who did not get glimpses into what blinds people in our day from themselves and what blocks them in finding values and goals they can affirm. Alfred Adler once said, referring to the children's school he had founded in Vienna, the pupils teach the teachers. It is always thus in psychotherapy, and I do not see how the therapist can be anything but deeply grateful for what he is daily taught about the issues and dignity of life by those who are called his patients. I am also grateful to my colleagues for the many things I have learned from them on these points, and to the students and faculty of Mills College in California for their rich and stimulating reactions when I discussed some of these ideas with them in my centennial lectures there on personal integrity in an age of anxiety. This book is not a substitute for psychotherapy, nor is it a self-help book in the sense that it promises cheap and easy cures overnight. But in another worthy and profound sense, every good book is a self-help book. It helps the listener through seeing himself and his own experiences reflected in the book to gain new light on his own problems of personal integration. I hope this is that kind of book. In these chapters, we shall analyze not only to the new insights of psychology on the hidden levels of the self— but also to the wisdom of those who, through the ages, in the fields of literature, philosophy, and ethics, have sought to understand how man can best meet his insecurity and personal crises, and turn them to constructive uses. Our aim is to discover ways in which we can stand against the insecurity of our time, to find a center of strength within ourselves, and, as far as we can, to point the way toward achieving values and goals which can be depended upon in a day when very little is secure. Rollo May, New York City To venture causes anxiety, but not to venture is to lose oneself, and to venture in the highest sense is precisely to become conscious of oneself. Kierkegaard the one goeth to his neighbor because he seeketh himself, and the other because he would fain lose himself. Your bad love to yourselves maketh solitude a prison to you. Nietzsche 
Part 1. Our Predicament 1. The Loneliness and Anxiety of Modern Man What are the major inner problems of people in our day? When we look beneath the outward occasions for people's disturbances, such as the threat of war, the draft, and economic uncertainty, what do we find are the underlying conflicts? To be sure, the symptoms of disturbance which people describe in our age as in any other are unhappiness, inability to decide about marriage or vocations, general despair and meaninglessness in their lives, and so on. But what underlies these symptoms? At the beginning of the twentieth century, the most common cause of such problems is what Sigmund Freud so well described, the person's difficulty in accepting the instinctual, sexual side of life and the resulting conflict between sexual impulses and social taboos. Then, in the 1920s, Otto Rank wrote that the underlying roots of people's psychological problems at that time were feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, and guilt. In the 1930s, the focus of psychological conflict shifted again. The common denominator then, as Karen Horney pointed out, was hostility between individuals and groups, often connected with the competitive feelings of who gets ahead of whom. What are the root problems in our middle of the twentieth century? The Hollow People It may sound surprising when I say, on the basis of my own clinical practice, as well as that of my psychological and psychiatric colleagues, that the chief problem of people in the middle decade of the twentieth century is emptiness. By that I mean not only that many people do not know what they want, they often do not have any clear idea of what they feel. When they talk about lack of autonomy or lament their inability to make decisions, difficulties which are present in all decades, it soon becomes evident that their underlying problem is that they have no definite experience of their own desires or wants. Thus, they feel swayed this way and that with painful feelings of powerlessness because they feel vacuous, empty. The complaint which leads them to come for help may be, for example, that their love relationships always break up, or that they cannot go through with marriage plans or are dissatisfied with the marriage partner. But they do not talk long before they make it clear that they expect the marriage partner, real or hoped for, to fill some lack some vacancy within themselves, and they are anxious and angry because he or she doesn't. They generally can talk fluently about what they should want, to complete their college degrees successfully, to get a job, to fall in love and marry and raise a family, but it is soon evident, even to them, that they are describing what others, parents, professors, employers, expect of them, rather than what they themselves want. Two decades ago, such external goals could be taken seriously, but now the person realizes, even as he talks, that actually his parents and society do not make all these requirements of him. In theory, at least, his parents have told him time and again that they give him freedom to make decisions for himself. And furthermore, the person realizes himself that it will not help him to pursue such external goals. But that only makes his problem the more difficult, since he has so little conviction or sense of the reality of his own goals. As one person put it, I'm just a collection of mirrors reflecting what everyone else expects of me. In previous decades, if a person who came for psychological help did not know what he wanted or felt, it generally could be assumed that he wanted something quite definite— such as some sexual gratification, but he dared not admit this to himself. As Freud made clear, the desire was there. The chief thing necessary was to clear up the repressions, bring the desire into consciousness, and eventually help the patient to become able to gratify his desire in accord with reality. But in our day, sexual taboos are much weaker. The Kinsey Report made that clear if anyone still doubted it. Opportunities for sexual gratification can be found without too much trouble by persons who do not have pronounced other problems. The sexual problems people bring today for therapy, furthermore, are rarely struggles against social prohibitions as such, 
but much more often are deficiencies within themselves, such as the lack of potency or the lack of capacity to have strong feelings in responding to the sexual partner. In other words, the most common problem now is not social taboos on sexual activity or guilt feelings about sex in itself, but the fact that sex for so many people is an empty, mechanical, and vacuous experience. A dream of a young woman illustrates the dilemma of the mirror person. She was quite emancipated sexually, but she wanted to get married and could not choose between two possible men. One man was the steady middle-class type of whom her well-to-do family would have approved, but the other shared more of her artistic and bohemian interests. In the course of her painful bouts of indecision, during which she could not make up her mind as to what kind of person she really was and what kind of life she wished to lead, she dreamt that a large group of people took a vote on which of the two men she should marry. During the dream, she felt relieved. This was certainly a convenient solution. The only trouble was... When she awoke, she couldn't remember which way the vote had gone. Many people could say out of their own inner experience the prophetic words T.S. Eliot wrote in 1925. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Perhaps some listeners are conjecturing that this emptiness, this inability to know what one feels or wants, is due to the fact that we live in a time of uncertainty, a time of war, military draft, economic change, with a future of insecurity facing us no matter how we look at it. So no wonder one doesn't know what to plan and feels futile. But this conclusion is too superficial. As we shall show later, the problems go much deeper than these occasions which cue them off. Furthermore, war, economic upheaval, and social change are really symptoms of the same underlying condition in our society, of which the psychological problems we are discussing are also symptoms. Other listeners may be raising another question. It may be true that people who come for psychological help feel empty and hollow, but aren't those neurotic problems and not necessarily true for the majority of people? To be sure, we would answer, the persons who get to the consulting rooms of psychotherapists and psychoanalysts are not a cross-section of the population. By and large, they are the ones for whom the conventional pretenses and defenses of the society no longer work. Very often, they are the more sensitive and gifted members of the society. They need to get help, broadly speaking, because they are less successful at rationalizing than the well-adjusted citizen who is able for the time being to cover up his underlying conflicts. Certainly the patients who came to Freud in the 1890s and the first decade of this century with the sexual symptoms he described were not representative of their Victorian culture. Most people around them went on living under the customary taboos and rationalizations of Victorianism, believing that sex was repugnant and should be covered up as much as possible. But after the First World War in the 1920s, those sexual problems became overt and epidemic. Almost every sophisticated person in Europe and America then experienced the same conflicts between sexual urges and social taboos, which the few had been struggling with a decade or two earlier. No matter how highly one thinks of Freud, one would not be naive enough to suggest that he, in his writings, caused this development. He merely predicted it. Thus, a relatively small number of people, those who come for psychotherapeutic help in the process of their struggle for inner integration, provide a very revealing and significant barometer of the conflicts and tensions under the psychological surface of the society. This barometer should be taken seriously, for it is one of the best indices of the disruptions and problems which have not yet, but may soon, break out widely in the society.
Furthermore, it is not only in the consulting rooms of psychologists and psychoanalysts that we observe the problems of modern man's inner emptiness. There is much sociological data to indicate that the hollowness is already cropping out in many different ways in our society. David Reisman, in his excellent book, The Lonely Crowd, which came to my attention just as I was writing these chapters, finds the same emptiness in his fascinating analysis of the present American character. Before World War I, says Reisman, the typical American individual was inner-directed. He had taken over the standards he was taught, was moralistic in the late Victorian sense, and had strong motives and ambitions, derived from the outside though they were. He lived as though he were given stability by an inner gyroscope. This was the type which fits the early psychoanalytic description of the emotionally repressed person who is directed by a strong superego. But the present typical American character, Reisman goes on to say, is outer-directed. He seeks not to be outstanding, but to fit in. He lives as though he were directed by a radar set fastened to his head, perpetually telling him what other people expect of him. This radar type gets his motives and directions from others. Like the man who described himself as a set of mirrors, he is able to respond, but not to choose. He has no effective center of motivation of his own. We do not mean, nor does Reisman, to imply an admiration for the inner-directed individuals of the late Victorian period. Such persons gained their strength by internalizing external rules, by compartmentalizing willpower and intellect, and by repressing their feelings. This type was well suited for business success, for, like the nineteenth-century railroad tycoons and the captains of industry, they could manipulate people in the same way as coal cars or the stock market. The gyroscope is an excellent symbol for them, since it stands for a completely mechanical center of stability. William Randolph Hearst was an example of this type. He amassed great power and wealth, but he was so anxious underneath this appearance of strength, particularly with regard to dying, that he would never allow anyone to use the word death in his presence. The gyroscope men often had disastrous influences on their children because of their rigidity, dogmatism, and inability to learn and to change. In my judgment, the attitudes and behaviors of these men are examples of how certain attitudes in a society tend to crystallize rigidly just before they collapse. It is easy to see how a period of emptiness would have to follow the breakdown of the period of the Iron Men. Take out the gyroscope, and they are hollow. So we shed no tears for the demise of the gyroscope man. One might place on his tombstone the epitaph, Like the dinosaur, he had power without the ability to change, strength without the capacity to learn. The chief value in our understanding these last representatives of the nineteenth century is that we shall then be less likely to be seduced by their pseudo-inner strength. If we clearly see that their gyroscope method of gaining psychological power was unsound and eventually self-defeating, and their inner direction a moralistic substitute for integrity rather than integrity itself, we shall be the more convinced of the necessity of finding a new center of strength within ourselves. Actually, our society has not yet found something to take the place of the gyroscope man's rigid rules. Reisman points out that the outer-directed people in our time generally are characterized by attitudes of passivity and apathy. The young people of today have by and large given up the driving ambition to excel, to be at the top, or if they do have such ambition, they regard it as a fault and are often apologetic for such a hangover from their father's mores. They want to be accepted by their peers, even to the extent of being inconspicuous and absorbed in the group. This sociological picture is very similar in its broad lines to the picture we get in psychological work with individuals. A decade or two ago, the emptiness which was beginning to be experienced on a fairly broad scale by the middle classes could be laughed at as the sickness of the suburbs. The clearest picture of the empty life is the suburban man, 
who gets up at the same hour every weekday morning, takes the same train to work in the city, performs the same task in the office, lunches at the same place, leaves the same tip for the waitress each day, comes home on the same train each night, has 2.3 children, cultivates a little garden, spends a two-week vacation at the shore every summer, which he does not enjoy, goes to church every Christmas and Easter, and moves through a routine mechanical existence year after year, until he finally retires at sixty-five and, very soon after, dies of heart failure, possibly brought on by repressed hostility. I have always had the secret suspicion, however, that he dies of boredom. But there are indications in the present decade that emptiness and boredom have become much more serious states for many people. Not long ago, a very curious incident was reported in the New York papers. A bus driver in the Bronx simply drove away in his empty bus one day and was picked up by the police several days later in Florida. He explained that, having gotten tired of driving the same route every day, he had decided to go away on a trip. While he was being brought back, it was clear from the papers that the bus company was having a hard time deciding whether or how he should be punished. By the time he arrived in the Bronx, he was a cause célèbre, and a crowd of people who apparently had never personally known the errant bus driver were on hand to welcome him. When it was announced that the company had decided not to turn him over for legal punishment, but to give him his job back again if he would promise to make no more jaunts, there was literal as well as figurative cheering in the Bronx. Why should these solid citizens of the Bronx, living in a metropolitan section which is almost synonymous with middle-class urban conventionality, make a hero out of a man who, according to their standards, was an auto thief and, worse yet, failed to appear at his regular time for work? Was it not that this driver who got bored to death with simply making his appointed rounds, going around the same blocks and stopping at the same corners day after day, typified some similar emptiness and futility in these middle-class people, and that his gesture, ineffectual as it was, represented some deep but repressed need in the solid citizens of the Bronx. On a small scale, this reminds us of the fact that the upper middle classes in bourgeois France several decades ago, as Paul Tillich has remarked, were able to endure the stultifying and mechanical routine of their commercial and industrial activities only by virtue of the presence of centers of bohemianism at their elbows. People who live as hollow men can endure the monotony only by an occasional blow-off, or at least by identifying with someone else's blow-off. In some circles, emptiness is even made a goal to be sought after, under the guise of being adaptable. Nowhere is this illustrated more arrestingly than in an article in Life magazine entitled The Wife Problem. Summarizing a series of researches which first appeared in Fortune about the role of the wives of corporation executives, this article points out that whether or not the husband is promoted depends a great deal on whether his wife fits the pattern. Time was when only the minister's wife was looked over by the trustees of the church before her husband was hired. Now the wife of the corporation executive is screened, covertly or overtly, by most companies like the steel or wool or any other commodity the company uses. She must be highly gregarious, not intellectual or conspicuous, and she must have very sensitive antennae, again, that radar set, so she can be forever adapting. The good wife is good by not doing things, by not complaining when her husband works late, by not fussing when a transfer is coming up, by not engaging in any controversial activity. Thus, her success depends not on how she actively uses her powers, but on her knowing when and how to be passive. But the rule that transcends all others, says life, is don't be too good. Keeping up with the Joneses is still important, but where in pushier and more primitive times it implied going substantially ahead of the Joneses, today keeping up means just that, keeping up. One can move ahead, yes, but slightly, 
and the timing must be exquisite. In the end, the company conditions almost everything the wife does, from the companions she is permitted to have down to the car she drives and what and how much she drinks and reads. To be sure, in return for this indenture, the modern corporation takes care of its members in the form of giving them added security, insurance, planned vacations, and so on. Life remarks that the company has become like Big Brother, the symbol for the dictator, in Orwell's novel 1984. The editors of Fortune confess that they find these results a little frightening. Conformity, it would appear, is being elevated into something akin to a religion. Perhaps Americans will arrive at an ant society, not through fiat of a dictator, but through unbridled desire to get along with one another. While one might laugh at the meaningless boredom of people a decade or two ago, the emptiness has for many now moved from the state of boredom to a state of futility and despair which holds promise of dangers. The widespread drug addiction among high school students in New York City has been quite accurately related to the fact that great numbers of these adolescents have very little to look forward to except the army and unsettled economic conditions and are without positive constructive goals. The human being cannot live in a condition of emptiness for very long. If he is not growing toward something, he does not merely stagnate the pent-up potentialities turn into morbidity and despair, and eventually into destructive activities. What is the psychological origin of this experience of emptiness? The feeling of emptiness, or vacuity, which we have observed sociologically and individually, should not be taken to mean that people are empty or without emotional potentiality. A human being is not empty in a static sense, as though he were a storage battery which needs charging. The experience of emptiness, rather, generally comes from people's feeling that they are powerless to do anything effective about their lives or the world they live in. Inner vacuousness is the long-term accumulated result of a person's particular conviction toward himself namely his conviction that he cannot act as an entity in directing his own life, or change other people's attitudes toward him, or effectively influence the world around him. Thus he gets the deep sense of despair and futility which so many people in our day have. And soon, since what he wants and what he feels can make no real difference, he gives up wanting and feeling. Apathy and lack of feeling are also defenses against anxiety. When a person continually faces dangers he is powerless to overcome, his final line of defense is, at last, to avoid even feeling the dangers. Sensitive students of our time have seen these developments coming. Eric Fromm has pointed out that people today no longer live under the authority of church or moral laws, but under anonymous authorities like public opinion. The authority is the public itself, but this public is merely a collection of many individuals, each with his radar set adjusted to finding out what the others expect of him. The corporation executive in the Life article is at the top because he and his wife have been successful in adjusting to public opinion. The public is thus made up of all the Toms, Marys, Dicks, and Harrys who are slaves to the authority of public opinion. Reisman makes the very relevant point that the public is therefore afraid of a ghost, a boogeyman, a chimera. It is an anonymous authority with a capital A when the authority is a composite of ourselves, but ourselves without any individual centers. We are, in the long run, afraid of our own collective emptiness. And we have good reason, as do the editors of Fortune, to be frightened by this situation of conformity and individual emptiness. We need only remind ourselves that the ethical and emotional emptiness in European society two and three decades ago was an open invitation to fascist dictatorships to step in and fill the vacuum. The great danger of this situation of vacuity and powerlessness 
is that it leads sooner or later to painful anxiety and despair, and ultimately, if it is not corrected, to futility and the blocking off of the most precious qualities of the human being. Its end results are the dwarfing and impoverishment of persons psychologically, or else surrender to some destructive authoritarianism. Loneliness Another characteristic of modern people is loneliness. They describe this feeling as one of being on the outside, isolated, or, if they are sophisticated, they say that they feel alienated. They emphasize how crucial it is for them to be invited to this party or that dinner, not because they especially want to go, though they generally do go, nor because they will get enjoyment, companionship, sharing of experience and human warmth in the gathering. Very often they do not, but are simply bored. Rather, being invited is crucial because it is a proof that they are not alone. Loneliness is such an omnipotent and painful threat to many persons that they have little conception of the positive values of solitude, and even at times are very frightened at the prospect of being alone. Many people suffer from the fear of finding oneself alone, remarks André Gide, and so they don't find themselves at all. The feelings of emptiness and loneliness go together. When persons, for example, are telling of a breakup in a love relationship, they will often not say they feel sorrow or humiliation over a lost conquest, but rather that they feel emptied. The loss of the other leaves an inner yawning void, as one person put it. The reasons for the close relationship between loneliness and emptiness are not difficult to discover. For when a person does not know with any inner conviction what he wants or what he feels, when, in a period of traumatic change, he becomes aware of the fact that the conventional desires and goals he has been taught to follow no longer bring him any security or give him any sense of direction, when, that is, he feels an inner void while he stands amid the outer confusion of upheaval in his society, he senses danger and his natural reaction is to look around for other people. They, he hopes, will give him some sense of direction, or at least some comfort in the knowledge that he is not alone in his fright. Emptiness and loneliness are thus two phases of the same basic experience of anxiety. Perhaps the listener can recall the anxiety which swept over us like a tidal wave when the first atom bomb exploded over Hiroshima, when we sensed our grave danger, sensed, that is, that we might be the last generation, but did not know in which direction to turn. At that moment, the reaction of great numbers of people was, strangely enough, a sudden, deep loneliness. Norman Cousins, endeavoring in his essay, Modern Man is Obsolete, to express the deepest feelings of intelligent people at that staggering historical moment, wrote not about how to protect oneself from atomic radiation or how to meet political problems or the tragedy of man's self-destruction. Instead, his editorial was a meditation on loneliness. All man's history, he proclaimed, is an endeavor to shatter his loneliness. Feelings of loneliness occur when one feels empty and afraid, not simply because one wants to be protected by the crowd, as a wild animal is protected by being in a pack, nor is the longing for others simply an endeavor to fill the void within oneself, though this certainly is one side of the need for human companionship when one feels empty or anxious. The more basic reason is that the human being gets his original experiences of being a self out of his relatedness to other persons, and when he is alone without other persons, he is afraid he will lose this experience of being a self. Man, the biosocial mammal, not only is dependent on other human beings, such as his father and mother, for his security during a long childhood, he likewise receives his consciousness of himself, which is the basis of his capacity to orient himself in life, from these early relationships. These important points we will discuss more thoroughly in a later chapter. 
Here we wish only to point out that part of the feeling of loneliness is that man needs relations with other people in order to orient himself. But another important reason for the feeling of loneliness arises from the fact that our society lays such a great emphasis on being socially accepted. It is our chief way of allaying anxiety and our chief mark of prestige. Thus we always have to prove we are a social success by being forever sought after and by never being alone. If one is well-liked, that is, socially successful, so the idea goes, one will rarely be alone. Not to be liked is to have lost out in the race. In the days of the gyroscope man and earlier, the chief criterion of prestige was financial success. Now the belief is that if one is well-liked, financial success and prestige will follow. Be well-liked, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman advises his sons, and you will never want. The reverse side of modern man's loneliness is his great fear of being alone. In our culture it is permissible to say you are lonely, for that is a way of admitting that it is not good to be alone. The melancholy romantic songs present this sentiment with the appropriate nostalgia. Me and my shadow, not a soul to tell our troubles to, just me and my shadow, all alone and feeling blue. And it is permissible to want to be alone temporarily to get away from it all. But if one mentioned at a party that he liked to be alone, not for a rest or an escape, but for its own joys, people would think that something was vaguely wrong with him, that some pariah aura of untouchability or sickness hovered round him. And if a person is alone very much of the time, people tend to think of him as a failure, for it is inconceivable to them that he would choose to be alone. This fear of being alone lies behind the great need of people in our society to get invited places, or if they invite someone else, to have the other accept. The pressure to keep dated up goes way beyond such realistic motives as the pleasure and warmth people get in each other's company, the enrichment of feelings, ideas, and experiences, or the sheer pleasure of relaxation. Actually, such motives have very little to do with the compulsion to get invited. Many of the more sophisticated persons are well aware of these points and would like to be able to say no, but they very much want the chance to go, and to turn down invitations in the usual round of social life means sooner or later one won't get invited. The cold fear that protrudes its icy head from subterranean levels is that one would then be shut out entirely, left on the outside. To be sure, in all ages people have been afraid of loneliness and have tried to escape it. Pascal in the seventeenth century observed the great efforts people make to divert themselves, and he opined that the purpose of the bulk of these diversions was to enable people to avoid thoughts of themselves. Kierkegaard a hundred years ago wrote that in his age one does everything possible by way of diversions and the Janissary music of loud-voiced enterprises to keep lonely thoughts away, just as in the forests of America they keep away wild beasts by torches, by yells, by the sound of cymbals. But the difference in our day is that the fear of loneliness is much more extensive and the defenses against it diversions, social rounds, and being liked, are more rigid and compulsive. Let us paint an impressionistic picture of a somewhat extreme, though not otherwise unusual, example of the fear of loneliness in our society as seen in the social activities at summer resorts. Let us take a typical, averagely well-to-do summer colony on the seashore, where people are vacationing and therefore do not have their work available for the time being as escape and support. It is of crucial importance for these people to keep up the continual merry-go-round of cocktail parties, despite the fact that they meet the same people every day at the parties, drink the same cocktails, and talk of the same subjects or lack of subjects. What is important is not what is said, but that some talk be continually going on. Silence is the great crime, for silence is lonely and frightening. 
One shouldn't feel much nor put much meaning into what one says. What you say seems to have more effect if you don't try to understand. One has this strange impression that these people are all afraid of something. What is it? It is as if the Yatata were a primitive tribal ceremony, a witch dance calculated to appease some god. There is a god, or rather a demon, they are trying to appease. It is the specter of loneliness which hovers outside like the fog drifting in from the sea. One will have to meet this specter's leering terror for the first half hour one is awake in the morning anyway, so let one do everything possible to keep it away now. Figuratively speaking, it is the specter of death they are trying to appease. Death as the symbol of ultimate separation, aloneness, isolation from other human beings. Admittedly, that illustration is extreme. In the day-to-day -day experience of most of us, the fear of being alone may not crop up in intense form very often. We generally have methods of keeping lonely thoughts away, and our anxiety may appear only in occasional dreams of fright which we try to forget as soon as possible in the morning. But these differences in intensity of the fear of loneliness and the relative success of our defenses against it do not change the central issue. Our fear of loneliness may not be shown by anxiety as such, but by subtle thoughts which pop up to remind us when we discover we were not invited to so-and-so's party, that someone else likes us, even if the person in question doesn't, or to tell us that we were successful or popular in such and such other time in the past. Often this reassuring process is so automatic that we are not aware of it in itself, but only of the ensuing comfort to our self-esteem. If we as citizens of the middle twentieth century look honestly into ourselves, that is, look below our customary pretenses, do we not find this fear of isolation as an almost constant companion, despite its many masquerades? The fear of being alone derives much of its terror from our anxiety, lest we lose our awareness of ourselves. If people contemplate being alone for longish periods of time without anyone to talk to or any radio to eject noise into the air, they generally are afraid that they would be at loose ends, would lose the boundaries for themselves, would have nothing to bump up against, nothing by which to orient themselves. It is interesting that they sometimes say that if they were alone for long, they wouldn't be able to work or play in order to get tired, and so they wouldn't be able to sleep, and then, though they generally cannot explain this, they would lose the distinction between wakefulness and sleep, just as they lose the distinction between the subjective self and the objective world around them. Every human being gets much of his sense of his own reality out of what others say to him and think about him. But many modern people have gone so far in their dependence on others for their feeling of reality that they are afraid that without it they would lose the sense of their own existence. They feel they would be dispersed like water flowing every which way on the sand. Many people are like blind men feeling their way along in life only by means of touching a succession of other people. In its extreme form, this fear of losing one's orientation is the fear of psychosis. When persons actually are on the brink of psychosis, they often have an urgent need to seek out some contact with other human beings. This is sound, for such relating gives them a bridge to reality. But the point we are discussing here has a different origin. Modern Western man, trained through four centuries of emphasis on rationality, uniformity, and mechanics, has consistently endeavored with unfortunate success to repress the aspects of himself which do not fit these uniform and mechanical standards. It is not too much to say that modern man, sensing his own inner hollowness, is afraid that if he should not have his regular associates around him, should not have the talisman of his daily program and his routine of work, if he should forget what time it is, that he would feel, though in an inarticulate way, some threat like that which one experiences on the brink of psychosis. 
When one's customary ways of orienting oneself are threatened and one is without other selves around one, one is thrown back on inner resources and inner strength. And this is what modern people have neglected to develop. Hence, loneliness is a real, not imaginary threat to many of them. Social acceptance, being liked, has so much power because it holds the feelings of loneliness at bay. A person is surrounded with comfortable warmth. He is merged in the group. He is reabsorbed as though in the extreme psychoanalytic symbol he were to go back into the womb. He temporarily loses his loneliness, but it is at the price of giving up his existence as an identity in his own right. And he renounces the one thing which would get him constructively over the loneliness in the long run, namely the developing of his own inner resources, strength, and sense of direction, and using this as a basis for meaningful relations with others. The stuffed men are bound to become more lonely no matter how much they lean together, for hollow people do not have a base from which to learn to love. Anxiety and the Threat to the Self Anxiety, the other characteristic of modern man, is even more basic than emptiness and loneliness. For being hollow and lonely would not bother us except that it makes us prey to that peculiar psychological pain and turmoil called anxiety. No one who reads the morning newspaper needs to be persuaded that we live in an age of anxiety. Two world wars in thirty-five years, economic upheavals and depressions, the eruption of fascist barbarism and the rise of communist totalitarianism, and now not only interminable half-wars, but the prospects of cold wars for decades to come while we skate literally on the edge of a third world war, complete with atom bombs. These simple facts from any daily journal are enough to show how the foundations of our world are shaken. It is no wonder that Bertrand Russell writes that the painful thing about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid and those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. I have indicated in a previous book, The Meaning of Anxiety, that our middle of the twentieth century is more anxiety-ridden than any period since the breakdown of the Middle Ages. Those years in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries, when Europe was inundated with anxiety in the form of fears of death, agonies of doubt about the meaning and value of life, superstition and fears of devils and sorcerers, is the nearest period comparable to our own. All one needs to do is read fears of atomic destruction, where historians of that twilight of medievalism write fears of death, loss of faith, and ethical values for agonies of doubt, and one has the beginning of a rough description of our times. We, too, have our superstitions in the form of anxiety about flying saucers and little men from Mars— and our devils and sorcerers in the demonic supermen of the Nazis and other totalitarian mythologies. Those who wish more detailed evidence of modern anxiety, as it shows itself in the rising incidence of emotional and mental disturbances, divorce and suicide, and in political and economic upheavals, can find it in the book mentioned before. Indeed, the phrase, Age of Anxiety, is almost a platitude already. We have become so inured to living in a state of quasi-anxiety that our real danger is the temptation to hide our eyes in ostrich fashion. We shall live amid upheavals, clashes, wars, and rumors of wars for two or three decades to come, and the challenge to the person of imagination and understanding is that he face these upheavals openly, and see if, by courage and insight, he can use his anxiety constructively. It is a mistake to believe that the contemporary wars and depressions and political threats are the total cause of our anxiety, for our anxiety also causes these catastrophes. The anxiety prevalent in our day and the succession of economic and political catastrophes our world has been going through are both symptoms of the same underlying cause— namely the traumatic changes occurring in Western society. 
Fascist and Nazi totalitarianism, for example, do not occur because a Hitler or Mussolini decides to seize power. When a nation rather is prey to insupportable economic want and is psychologically and spiritually empty, totalitarianism comes in to fill the vacuum, and the people sell their freedom as a necessity for getting rid of the anxiety which is too great for them to bear any longer. The confusion and bewilderment in our nation show this anxiety on a broad scale. In this period of wars and threats of wars, we know what we are against, namely totalitarian encroachment on man's freedom and dignity. We are confident enough of our military strength, but we fight defensively. We are like a strong animal at bay, turning this way and that, not being sure whether to fight on this flank or the other, whether to wait or to attack. As a nation, we have had great difficulty deciding how far to go in Korea, whether we should make war here or there, or whether we should draw the line against totalitarianism at this point or that. If anyone should attack us, we should be completely united, but we are confused about constructive goals. What are we working for except defense? And even the gestures of new goals which give magnificent promise for a new world, such as the Marshall Plan, are questioned by some groups. When an individual suffers anxiety continuously over a period of time, he lays his body open to psychosomatic illness. When a group suffers continuous anxiety with no agreed-on constructive steps to take, its members sooner or later turn against each other. Just so, when our nation is in confusion and bewilderment, we lay ourselves open to such poison as the character assassinations of McCarthyism, witch hunts, and the ubiquitous pressures to make every man suspicious of his neighbor. Turning our glance from the society to the individual, we see the most obvious expressions of anxiety in the prevalence of neurosis and other emotional disturbances— which, as practically everyone from Freud onward has agreed, have their root cause in anxiety. Anxiety, likewise, is the common denominator psychologically of the psychosomatic disturbances, such as ulcers, many of the forms of heart trouble, and so forth. Anxiety, in fine, is our modern form of the Great White Plague, the greatest destroyer of human health and well-being. When we look below the surface of our individual anxiety, we find that it also comes from something more profound than the threat of war and economic uncertainty. We are anxious because we do not know what roles to pursue, what principles for action to believe in. Our individual anxiety, somewhat like that of the nation, is a basic confusion and bewilderment about where we are going. Shall a man strive competitively to become economically successful and wealthy, as we used to be taught, or a good fellow who is liked by everyone? He cannot be both. Shall he follow the supposed teaching of the society with regard to sex and be monogamous, or should he follow the average of what's done, as shown in the Kinsey Report? These are only two examples of a condition that will be inquired into later in this book, namely, the basic bewilderment about goals and values which modern people feel. Dr. and Mrs. Lind, in their study of an American town in the Middle West in the 1930s, Middletown in Transition, reported that the citizens of this typical community were caught in a chaos of conflicting patterns, none of them wholly condemned, but no one of them clearly approved and free from confusion— the chief difference between Middletown in the 1930s and our present situation, I believe, is that the confusion has now gone deeper to the levels of feelings and desires. In such bewilderment, many persons experience the inward gnawing apprehension of the young man in Auden's poem, The Age of Anxiety. It is getting late. Shall we ever be asked for? Are we simply not wanted at all? If anyone believes there are simple answers to these questions, he has neither understood the questions nor the times in which we live. This is a time, as Hermann Hesse puts it, when a whole generation is caught between two ages, two modes of life, 
with the consequence that it loses all power to understand itself and has no standards, no security, no simple acquiescence. But it is well to remind ourselves that anxiety signifies a conflict, and so long as a conflict is going on, a constructive solution is possible. Indeed, our present upsets are as much a proof of new possibilities for the future, as we shall hear later, as they are of present catastrophe. What is necessary for the constructive use of anxiety is, first of all, that we frankly admit and face our perilous state individually and socially. As an aid to doing this, we shall now endeavor to get a clearer idea of the meaning of anxiety. What is anxiety? How shall we define anxiety, and how is it related to fear? If you are walking across a highway and see a car speeding toward you, your heart beats faster, you focus your eyes on the distance between the car and you, and how far you have to go to get to the safe side of the road, and you hurry across. You felt fear, and it energized you to rush to safety. But if, when you start to hurry across the road, you are surprised by cars coming down the far lane from the opposite direction, you suddenly are caught in the middle of the road, not knowing which way to turn. Your heart pounds faster, but now, in contrast to the experience of fear before, you feel panicky and your vision may be suddenly blurred. You have an impulse, which, let us hopefully assume, you control, to run blindly in any direction. After the cars have sped by, you may be aware of a slight faintness and a feeling of hollowness in the pit of the stomach. This is anxiety. In fear, we know what threatens us. We are energized by the situation. Our perceptions are sharper, and we take steps to run or, in the other appropriate ways, to overcome the danger. In anxiety, however, we are threatened without knowing what steps to take to meet the danger. Anxiety is the feeling of being caught, overwhelmed, and instead of becoming sharper, our perceptions generally become blurred or vague. Anxiety may occur in slight or great intensity. It may be a mild tension before meeting some important person, or it may be apprehension before an examination when one's future is at stake and one is uncertain whether one is prepared to pass the exam. Or, it may be the stark terror when beads of sweat appear on one's forehead in waiting to hear whether a loved one is lost in a plane wreck, or whether one's child is drowned or gets back safely after the storm on the lake. People experience anxiety in all sorts of ways, a gnawing within, a constriction of the chest, a general bewilderment, or they may describe it as feeling as though all the world around were dark gray or black, or as though a heavy weight were upon them or as a feeling like the terror which a small child experiences when he realizes he is lost. Indeed, anxiety may take all forms and intensities, for it is the human being's basic reaction to a danger to his existence or to some value he identifies with his existence. Fear is a threat to one side of the self. If a child is in a fight, he may get hurt, but that hurt would not be a threat to his existence— or the university student may be somewhat scared by a midterm, but he knows the sky will not fall in if he does not pass it. But as soon as the threat becomes great enough to involve the total self, one then has the experience of anxiety. Anxiety strikes us at the very core of ourselves. It is what we feel when our existence as selves is threatened. It is the quality of an experience which makes it anxiety rather than the quantity. One may feel only a slight gnawing away in one's stomach when a supposed friend passes one on the street and does not speak. But though the threat is not intense, the fact that the gnawing continues and that one is confused and searches around for an explanation of why the friend snubbed one shows the threat is to something basic in us. In its full-blown intensity, Anxiety is the most painful emotion to which the human animal is heir. Present dangers are less than future imaginings, as Shakespeare puts it, and people have been known to leap out of a lifeboat and drown rather than face the greater agony of continual doubt and uncertainty 
never knowing whether they will be rescued or not. The threat of death is the most common symbol for anxiety, but most of us in our civilized era do not find ourselves looking into the barrel of a gun or, in other ways, specifically threatened with death very often. The great bulk of our anxiety comes when some value we hold essential to our existence as selves is threatened. Tom, the man who will go down in scientific history because he had a hole in his stomach through which the doctors at New York Hospital could observe his psychosomatic reactions in times of anxiety, fear, and other stress, gave a beautiful illustration of this. In a period when Tom was anxious about whether he could keep his job at the hospital or would have to go on relief, he exclaimed, If I could not support my family, I'd as soon jump off the dock. That is, if the value of being a self-respecting wage earner were threatened, Tom, like the salesman Willie Loman and countless other men in our society, would feel he no longer existed as a self and might as well be dead. This illustrates what is true in one way or another for practically all human beings. Certain values, be they success or the love of someone or freedom to speak the truth as in the case of Socrates or Joan of Arc's being true to her inner voices, are believed in as the core of the person's reason for living, and if such a value is destroyed, the person feels his existence as a self might as well be destroyed likewise. Give me liberty or give me death is not just rhetoric nor is it pathological. Since the dominant values for most people in our society are being liked, accepted, and approved of, much anxiety in our day comes from the threat of not being liked, being isolated, lonely, or cast off. Most examples of anxiety given before are normal anxiety, that is, anxiety which is proportionate to the real threat of the danger situation. In a fire, battle, or crucial examination in the university, for example, anyone would feel more or less anxiety. It would be unrealistic not to. Every human being experiences normal anxiety in many different ways as he develops and confronts the various crises of life. The more he is able to face and move through these normal crises, the weaning from mother, going off to school, and, sooner or later, taking responsibility for his own vocation and marriage decisions, the less neurotic anxiety he will develop. Normal anxiety cannot be avoided. It should be frankly admitted to oneself. This book will be chiefly concerned with the normal anxiety of the person living in our age of transition and the constructive ways this anxiety can be met. But, of course, much anxiety is neurotic, and we should at least define it. Suppose a young man, a musician, goes out on his first date, and for reasons he cannot understand, he is very much afraid of the girl and has a fairly miserable time. Then, suppose, he dodges this real problem by vowing to cut girls out of his life and devote himself only to his music. A few years later, as a successful bachelor musician, however, he finds he is very strangely inhibited around women, cannot speak to them without blushing, is afraid of his secretary and scared to death of the women chairman of committees he must deal with in arranging his concert schedule. He can find no objective reason for being so frightened, for he knows the women are not going to shoot him and, in actual fact, have very little power over him. He is experiencing neurotic anxiety, that is, anxiety disproportionate to the real danger and arising from an unconscious conflict within himself. The listener already will have suspected that this young musician must have had some serious conflict with his own mother, which now carries over unconsciously and makes him afraid of all women. Most neurotic anxiety comes from such unconscious psychological conflicts. The person feels threatened, but it is as though by a ghost. He does not know where the enemy is or how to fight it or flee from it. These unconscious conflicts usually get started in some previous situation of threat which the person did not feel strong enough to face, such as a child's having to deal with a dominating and possessive parent, or having to face the fact that his parents don't love him. The real problem is then repressed, and it returns later as an inner conflict 
bringing with it neurotic anxiety. The way to deal with neurotic anxiety is to bring out the original real experience one was afraid of, and then to work the apprehension through as normal anxiety or fear. In dealing with any severe neurotic anxiety, the mature and wise step is to get professional psychotherapeutic help. But our main concern in these chapters is to understand how to use normal anxiety constructively. And to do that, we need to make clearer one very important point, the relation between a person's anxiety and his self-awareness. After a terrifying experience such as a battle or fire, people often remark, I felt as though I were in a daze. This is because anxiety knocks out the props, so to speak, from our awareness of ourselves. Anxiety, like a torpedo, strikes underneath at the deepest level or core of ourselves, and it is on this level that we experience ourselves as persons, as subjects who can act in a world of objects. Thus, anxiety, in greater or lesser degree, tends to destroy our consciousness of ourselves. In a battle, for example, so long as the enemy attacks the front lines, the soldiers in the defending army, despite their fear, continue fighting. But if the enemy succeeds in blowing up the center of communications behind the lines, then the army loses its direction, the troops move helter-skelter, and the army is no longer aware of itself as a fighting unit. The soldiers are then in a state of anxiety or panic. This is what anxiety does to the human being. It disorients him, wiping out temporarily his clear knowledge of what and who he is, and blurring his view of reality around him. This bewilderment, this confusion as to who we are and what we should do, is the most painful thing about anxiety. But the positive and hopeful side is that just as anxiety destroys our self-awareness, so awareness of ourselves can destroy anxiety. That is to say, the stronger our consciousness of ourselves, the more we can take a stand against and overcome anxiety. Anxiety, like a fever, is a sign that an inner struggle is in progress. As fever is a symptom that the body is mobilizing its physical powers and giving battle to the infection, let us say the tuberculosis bacilli in the lungs, so anxiety is evidence that a psychological or spiritual battle is going on. We have noted before that neurotic anxiety is the sign of an unresolved conflict within us, and so long as the conflict is present, there is an open possibility that we can become aware of the causes of conflict and find a solution on a higher level of health. Neurotic anxiety is nature's way, as it were, of indicating to us that we need to solve a problem. The same is true of normal anxiety. It is a signal for us to call up our reserves and do battle against a threat. As the fever in our example is a symptom of the battle between the bodily powers and the infecting germs, so anxiety is evidence of a battle between our strength as a self on one side and a danger which threatens to wipe out our existence as a self on the other. The more the threat wins, the more then our awareness of ourselves is surrendered, curtailed, hemmed in. But the greater our self-strength, that is, the greater our capacity to preserve our awareness of ourselves and the objective world around us, the less we will be overcome by the threat. There is still hope for a tuberculosis patient so long as he has fever. But in the final stages of the disease, when the body has given up, as it were, the fever leaves and soon the patient dies. Just so, the only thing which would signify the loss of hope for getting through our present difficulties as individuals and as a nation would be a resigning into apathy and a failure to feel and face our anxiety constructively. Our task, then, is to strengthen our consciousness of ourselves, to find centers of strength within ourselves which will enable us to stand despite the confusion and bewilderment around us. This is the central purpose of the inquiry in this book. First, however, we shall endeavor to see more clearly how our present predicament 
came upon us. 2. The Roots of Our Malady The first step in overcoming problems is to understand their causes. What has been happening in our Western world that individuals and nations should be buffeted about by so much confusion and bewilderment? Let us first ask, with a brief glance into our historical background, what basic changes are occurring which make this an age of anxiety and emptiness? The Loss of the Center of Values in Our Society The central fact is that we live at one of those points in history when one way of living is in its death throes and another is being born. That is to say, the values and goals of Western society are in a state of transition. What specifically are the values that we have lost? One of the two central beliefs in the modern period since the Renaissance has been in the value of individual competition. The conviction was that the more a man worked to further his own economic self-interest and to become wealthy, the more he would contribute to the material progress of the community. This famous laissez-faire theory in economics worked well for several centuries. It was true through the early and growing stages of modern industrialism and capitalism that for you or me to strive to become rich by increasing our trade or building a bigger factory would eventually mean the production of more material goods for the community. The pursuit of competitive enterprise was a magnificent and courageous idea in its heyday. But in the 19th and 20th centuries, considerable changes occurred. In our present day of giant business and monopoly capitalism, how many people can become successful as individual competitors? There are very few groups left who, like doctors and psychotherapists and some farmers, still have the luxury of being their own economic bosses, and even they are subject to the rise and fall of prices and the fluctuating market like everyone else. The vast majority of working men and capitalists alike, professional people or businessmen, must fit into broad groups, such as labor unions or big industries or university systems, or they would not survive economically at all. We have been taught to strive to get ahead of the next man, but actually today one's success depends much more on how well one learns to work with one's fellow workers. I have just read that even the individual crook cannot make out very well on his own these days. He has to join a racket. We do not mean that something is wrong with individual effort and initiative as such. Indeed, the chief argument of this book is that the unique powers and initiative of each individual must be rediscovered and used as a basis for work which contributes to the good of the community, rather than melted down in the collectivist pot of conformity. But we do mean that in the twentieth century, when scientific and other advances have made us much more closely interdependent in our nation as well as in our world, individualism must become a different thing from each man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. If you or I had to farm to carve out of the frontier forest two centuries ago, or possessed a little capital with which to start a new business last century— the philosophy of each man for himself would have brought out the best in us and resulted in the best for the community. But how does such competitive individualism work in a day when even corporation wives are screened to fit the pattern? The individual striving for his own gain in fine without an equal emphasis on social welfare no longer automatically brings good to the community. Furthermore, this type of individual competitiveness, in which for you to fail in a deal is as good as for me to succeed, since it pushes me ahead in the scramble up the ladder, raises many psychological problems. It makes every man the potential enemy of his neighbor. It generates much interpersonal hostility and resentment, and increases greatly our anxiety and isolation from each other. As this hostility has come closer to the surface in recent decades, we have tried to cover it up by various devices, by becoming joiners of all sorts of service organizations, from Rotary to Optimist Clubs in the 1920s and 30s, 
by being good fellows, well-liked by all, and so on. But the conflict sooner or later bursts forth into the open. This is pictured beautifully and tragically in Willie Loman, the chief character in Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Willie had been taught, and in turn taught his sons, that to get ahead of the next fellow and to get rich were the goals, and this required initiative. When the boys steal balls and lumber, Willie, though he pays lip service to the idea that he should rebuke them, is pleased that they are fearless characters, and remarks that the coach will probably congratulate them on their initiative. His friend reminds him that the jails are full of fearless characters, but Willie rejoins, the stock exchange is too. Willie tries to cover up his competitiveness, like most men of two or three decades ago, by being well-liked. When, as an old man, he is cast into the ash can by virtue of the changing policies of his company, Willie is caught in great bewilderment and keeps repeating to himself, But I was the best liked. His confusion in this conflict of values, why does what he was taught not work, mounts up until it culminates in his suicide. At the grave, one son continues to insist he had a good dream to come out number one. But the other son accurately sees the contradiction which such an upheaval of values leads to. He never knew who he was. The second central belief in our modern age has been the faith in individual reason. This belief, ushered in at the Renaissance like the belief in the value of individual competitiveness which we have just been discussing, was magnificently fruitful for the philosophical quests of the Enlightenment in the seventeenth century, and served as a noble charter for the advances in science and for movements toward universal education. In these first centuries of our period, individual reason also meant universal reason. It was a challenge to each intelligent person to discover the universal principles by which all men might live happily. But again, a change became apparent in the nineteenth century. Psychologically, reason became separated from emotion and will. The splitting up of the personality was prepared by Descartes in his famous dichotomy between body and mind, which will dog our tracks throughout this book, but the full consequences of this dichotomy did not emerge till last century. For the late nineteenth and early twentieth century man, reason was supposed to give the answer to any problem, willpower was supposed to put it into effect, and emotions, well, they generally got in the way and could best be repressed. Lo and behold, we then find reason, now transformed into intellectualistic rationalization, used in the service of compartmentalizing the personality, with the resulting repressions and conflict between instinct and ego and superego which Freud so well described. When Spinoza in the seventeenth century used the word reason, he meant an attitude toward life in which the mind united the emotions with the ethical goals and other aspects of the whole man. When people today use the term, they almost always imply a splitting of the personality. They ask in one form or another, should I follow reason, or give way to sensual passions and needs, or be faithful to my ethical duty? The beliefs in individual competition and reason we have been discussing are the ones which in actuality have guided modern Western development and are not necessarily the ideal values. To be sure, the values accepted as ideal by most people have been those of the Hebrew Christian tradition allied with ethical humanism, consisting of such precepts as love thy neighbor, serve the community, and so on. On the whole, these ideal values have been taught in schools and churches hand in hand with the emphasis on competition and individual reason. We can see the watered-down influence of the values of service and love coming out in roundabout fashion in the service clubs and the great emphasis on being well-liked. Indeed, the two sets of values— the one running back many centuries to the sources of our ethical and religious traditions in ancient Palestine and Greece, and the other born in the Renaissance, 
were to a considerable extent wedded. For example, Protestantism, which was the religious side of the cultural revolution beginning in the Renaissance, expressed the new individualism by emphasizing each person's right and ability to find religious truth for himself. The marriage had a good deal to be said for it, and for several centuries the squabbles between the marriage partners were ironed out fairly well. For the ideal of the brotherhood of man was, to a considerable extent, furthered by economic competition. The tremendous scientific gains, the new factories, and the more rapid moving of the wheels of industry increased man's material wealth and physical health immensely, and for the first time in history our factories and our science can now produce so much that it is possible to wipe starvation and material want from the face of the earth. One could well have argued that science and competitive industry were bringing mankind ever closer to its ethical ideals of universal brotherhood. But in the last few decades it has become clear that this marriage is full of conflict and is headed for drastic overhauling or for divorce. For now, the great emphasis on one person getting ahead of the other, whether it be getting higher grades in school or more stars after one's name in Sunday school or gaining proof of salvation by being economically successful, greatly blocks the possibilities of loving one's neighbor. And, as we shall see later, it even blocks the love between brother and sister and husband and wife in the same family. Furthermore, since our world is now made literally one world by scientific and industrial advances, our inherited emphasis on individual competitiveness is as obsolete as though each man were to deliver his own letters by his own Pony Express. The final eruption which showed the underlying contradictions in our society was fascist totalitarianism, in which the humanist and Hebrew Christian values, particularly the value of the person, were flouted in a mammoth upsurgence of barbarism. Some listeners may be thinking that many of the previous questions are stated wrongly. Why does economic striving need to be against one's fellow men, and why reason against emotion? True, but the characteristic of a period of change like the present is precisely that everyone does ask the wrong questions. The old goals, criteria, principles are still there in our minds and habits, but they do not fit, and hence most people are eternally frustrated by asking questions which never could lead to the right answer. Or they become lost in a potpourri of contradictory answers— Reason operates while one goes to class, emotion when one visits one's lover, willpower when one studies for an exam, and religious duty at funerals and on Easter Sunday. This compartmentalization of values and goals leads very quickly to an undermining of the personality, and the person, in pieces within as well as without, does not know which way to go. Several great men living in the last of the 19th century and first of the 20th century saw the splitting up of personality which was occurring. Henrik Ibsen in literature realized what was happening, Paul Cezanne in art, and Sigmund Freud in the science of human nature. Each of these men proclaimed that we must find a new unity for our lives. Ibsen showed in his play A Doll's House that if the husband simply goes off to business— keeping his work and his family in different compartments like a good nineteenth-century banker and treats his wife as a doll, the house will collapse. Cezanne attacked the artificial and sentimental art of the nineteenth century and showed that art must deal with the honest realities of life, and that beauty has more to do with integrity than with prettiness. Freud pointed out that if people repress their emotions and try to act as if sex and anger did not exist, they end up neurotic. And he worked out a new technique for bringing out the deeper, unconscious, irrational levels in personality which had been suppressed, thus helping the person to become a thinking, feeling, willing unity. So significant was the work of Ibsen, Cezanne, and Freud 
that many of us used to believe that they were the prophets for our times. True, the contribution of each is probably the most important in their respective fields, but were they not in one respect the last great men of the old period, rather than the first of the new? For they presupposed the values and goals of the past three centuries. Important and enduring as their new techniques were, they coasted on the goals of their time. They lived before the age of emptiness. It seems now, unfortunately, that the true prophets for the middle twentieth century were Soren Kierkegaard, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Franz Kafka. I say, unfortunately, because that means our task is that much more difficult. Each one of these men foresaw the destruction of values which would occur in our time, the loneliness, emptiness, and anxiety which would engulf us in the twentieth century. Each saw that we cannot ride on the goals of the past. We shall quote these three frequently in this book, not because they are intrinsically the wisest men in history, but because each foresaw with great power and insight the particular dilemmas which almost every intelligent person faces now. Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, proclaimed that science in the late nineteenth century was becoming a factory, and he feared that man's great advances in techniques without a parallel advance in ethics and self-understanding would lead to nihilism. Uttering prophetic warnings about what would happen in the twentieth century, he wrote a parable about the death of God. It is a haunting story of a madman who runs into the village square shouting, Where is God? The people around did not believe in God. They laughed and said perhaps God had gone on a voyage or emigrated. The madman then shouted, Whither is God? I shall tell you, we have killed him, you and I. Yet how have we done this? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither do we move now, away from all suns? Do we not fall incessantly, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there yet any up and down? Do we not err as through an infinite knot? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night and more night coming on all the while? God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Here the madman became silent and looked again at his listeners. They too remained silent and looked at him. I come too early, he said then. This tremendous event is still on its way. Nietzsche is not calling for a return to the conventional belief in God, but he is pointing out what happens when a society loses its center of values. That his prophecy came true is shown in the waves of massacres, pogroms, and tyranny in the middle twentieth century. The tremendous event was on its way. A frightful night of barbarism did descend on us when the humanistic and Hebrew Christian values of our period were so flouted. The way out, says Nietzsche, is a finding of a center of values anew, what he terms revaluation or transvaluation of all values. Revaluation of all values, he proclaims, that is my formula for an act of ultimate examination by mankind. The upshot is that the values and goals which provided a unifying center for previous centuries in the modern period no longer are cogent. We have not yet found the new center which will enable us to choose our goals constructively and thus to overcome the painful bewilderment and anxiety of not knowing which way to move. The Loss of the Sense of Self Another root of our malady is our loss of the sense of the worth and dignity of the human being. Nietzsche predicted this when he pointed out that the individual was being swallowed up in the herd, and that we were living by a slave morality. Marx also predicted it when he proclaimed that modern man was being dehumanized, and Kafka showed in his amazing stories how people literally can lose their identity as persons. But this loss of the sense of self did not occur overnight. 
Those of us who lived in the 1920s can recall the evidences of the growing tendency to think of the self in superficial and oversimplified terms. In those days, self-expression was supposed to be simply doing whatever popped into one's head, as though the self were synonymous with any random impulse, and as though one's decisions were to be made on the basis of a whim which might be the product of indigestion from a hurried lunch just as often as one's philosophy of life. To be yourself was then an excuse for relaxing into the lowest common denominator of inclination. To know oneself wasn't thought to be especially difficult, and the problems of personality could be solved relatively easily by better adjustment. These views were furthered by oversimplified psychology like John B. Watson's brand of behaviorism. We were then congratulating ourselves that the child could be conditioned out of fear, superstition, and other problems by techniques not essentially different from the way the dog's saliva is conditioned to flow every time the dinner gong rings. These superficial views of the human situation were also furthered by the belief in automatic economic progress. We would all get richer and richer without too much struggle or suffering. And these views got their final sanction in a religious moralism flourishing in the 1920s, which had never developed beyond the Sunday school stage, and smacked more of Kueism and Pollyannaism than of the profound insights of the historical, ethical, and religious leaders. Practically everyone who put pen to paper in those days shared the same oversimplified view of the human being. Bertrand Russell, who I believe would take a quite different view today, wrote in the 1920s that science was advancing so rapidly that soon we would give people whatever temperament one desired, choleric or timid, strongly or weakly sexed, merely by chemical injections into the body. This kind of push-button psychology was due for the satire which Aldous Huxley gave it in his Brave New World. Though the 1920s seemed to be a time when men had great confidence in the power of the person, it was actually the opposite. They had confidence in techniques and gadgets, not in the human being. The oversimplified mechanical view of the self really betokened an underlying lack of belief in the dignity, complexity, and freedom of the person. In the two decades since the 1920s, the disbelief in the power and dignity of the person became more openly accepted, for there appeared a good deal of concrete evidence that the individual self was insignificant and that one's personal choices didn't matter. In the face of totalitarian movements and uncontrolled economic earthquakes like the Major Depression, we tended to feel smaller and smaller as persons— the individual self was dwarfed into as ineffectual a position as the proverbial grain of sand pushed around by ocean breakers. We move on, as the wheel wills. One revolution registers all things, the rise and fall in pay and prices. Most people now, therefore, are able to find good external reasons for their belief that, as selves, they are insignificant and powerless. For how can one act, they well ask, in the face of the giant economic, political, and social movements of the time? Authoritarianism in religion and science, let alone politics, is becoming increasingly accepted, not particularly because so many people explicitly believe in it, but because they feel themselves individually powerless and anxious. So what else can one do, goes the reasoning, except follow the mass political leader, as happened in Europe, or follow the authority of customs, public opinion, and social expectations, as is the tendency in this country? What is forgotten in such reasoning is, of course, the fact that the loss of belief in the worth of the person is partly the cause of these mass social and political movements, or, to put it more accurately, the loss of the self and the rise of collectivist movements, as we have pointed out, are both the result of the same underlying historical changes in our society. We need, therefore, to fight on both flanks, to oppose totalitarianism and the other tendencies toward dehumanization of the person on one flank, and to recover our experience and belief 
in the worth and dignity of the person on the other. A startling picture of the loss of the sense of self in our society is given in a short novel, The Stranger, by the contemporary French author Albert Camus. It is the story of a Frenchman who is extraordinary in no respect. Indeed, he might well be called an average modern man. He experiences the death of his mother, goes to work and about the ordinary things of life, has an affair and sexual experiences, all without any clear decision or awareness on his part. He later shoots a man, and it is vague even in his own mind whether he shot by accident or in self-defense. He goes through a murder trial and is executed, all with a horrible sense of unreality, as though everything happened to him. He never acted himself. The book is pervaded by a vagueness and haze which is frustrating and shocking, like the similar haze of indecisiveness in Kafka's stories. Everything seems to take place in a dream, with the man never really related to the world or anything he does or to himself. He is a man without courage or despair, despite the outwardly tragic events, because he has no awareness of himself. At the end, when he is awaiting execution, he almost gets a glimmer of the realization, as expressed, say, in the words of George Herbert, a sick-tossed vessel, dashing on each thing. My God, I mean myself. Almost, but not quite. There is not enough sense of himself for even that to break through. The novel is a haunting and subtly terrifying picture of the modern man who is truly a stranger to himself. Less dramatic illustrations of the loss of the sense of power of the self are present all around us in contemporary society, and indeed are so common that we generally take them for granted. For example, there is the curious remark made regularly nowadays at the end of radio programs, Thanks for listening. This remark is quite amazing when you come to think of it, why should the person who is doing the entertaining, who is giving something ostensibly of value, thank the receiver for taking it? To acknowledge applause is one thing, but thanking the recipient for deigning to listen and be amused is a quite different thing. It betokens that the action is given its value or lack of value by the whim of the consumer, the receiver, in the case of our illustration, the consumers being their majesties, the public. Imagine Chrysler, after playing a concerto, thanking the audience for listening. The parallel suggested by the radio announcer's remark is the court jester, who not only had to perform, but at the same time to beg the majesties who watched to deign to be amused. And, proverbially, the court jester was in as humiliating a position as a human being could occupy. Obviously, we are not criticizing radio announcers as such. This remark merely illustrates an attitude which runs through our society. So many people judge the value of their actions not on the basis of the action itself, but on the basis of how the action is accepted. It is as though one had always to postpone his judgment until he looked at his audience. The person who is passive, to whom or for whom the act is done, has the power to make the act effective or ineffective, rather than the one who is doing it. Thus we tend to be performers in life, rather than persons who live and act as selves. To use an illustration from the sphere of sex, it is as though a man were to perform intercourse in the attitude of imploring the woman to please be satisfied, an attitude which actually exists, though often unconsciously, among men in our society more widely than is generally realized. And to illustrate how this attitude backfires in personal relations, we may add that if the man is mainly concerned with satisfying the woman— his full abandon and active strength do not come into the relationship, and in many cases this is precisely the reason the woman does not receive full gratification. No matter how skillful the gigolo's technique, what woman would choose it as a substitute for the reality of passion? The essence of the gigolo, court-jester attitude 
is that power and value are correlated not with action, but with passivity. Another example of how the sense of the self has been disintegrating in our day can be seen when we consider humor and laughter. It is not generally realized how closely one's sense of humor is connected with one's sense of selfhood. Humor normally should have the function of preserving the sense of self. It is an expression of our uniquely human capacity to experience ourselves as subjects who are not swallowed up in the objective situation. It is the healthy way of feeling a distance between one's self and the problem, a way of standing off and looking at one's problem with perspective. One cannot laugh when in an anxiety panic, for then one is swallowed up, one has lost the distinction between himself as subject and the objective world around him. So long as one can laugh furthermore, he is not completely under the domination of anxiety or fear. Hence the accepted belief in folklore that to be able to laugh in times of danger is a sign of courage. In cases of borderline psychotics, so long as the person has genuine humor, so long, that is, as he can laugh or look at himself with the thought, as one person put it, what a crazy person I've been, he is preserving his identity as a self. When any of us, neurotic or not, get insights into our psychological problems, our spontaneous reaction is normally a little laugh, the aha of insight, as it is called. The humor occurs because of a new appreciation of oneself as a subject acting in an objective world. Now, having seen the function humor normally fills for the human being, let us ask, what are the prevalent attitudes toward humor and laughter in our society? The most striking fact is that laughter is made a commodity. We speak of a laugh, or one remarks that a movie or radio program has such and such number of laughs, as shown by a computing and volume recording machine, as though laughter was a quantity like a dozen oranges or a bushel of apples. To be sure, there are some exceptions. The writings of E.B. White, for a rare example, show how humor can deepen the listener's feeling of worth and dignity as a person and remove blinds from his eyes as he confronts the issues facing him. But in general, humor and laughter in our day mean laughs in quantitative form, produced by mail-order push-button techniques, as is the case, let us say, of the productions of the gag writers for the radio. Indeed, the term gag is a fitting one. The laughs serve as laughing gas, in Thorstein Veblen's vivid phrase, to furnish a dulling of sensitivities and awareness just as gas does in actuality. Laughter is then an escape from anxiety and emptiness in ostrich fashion, rather than a way of gaining new and more courageous perspective in facing one's perplexities. Such laughter, which is often expressed in the raucous guffaw, may have the function of a simple release of tension, like alcohol or sexual stimulation, but again, like sex or drinking when engaged in for escapist reasons, this kind of laughter leaves one as lonely and unrelated to himself afterwards as before. Some laughter, of course, is of the vindictive type. This is the laugh of triumph, the telltale mark of which is that the laughter bears no relation to smiling. One may thus laugh in anger or rage, it often seemed to me that this was the kind of grimace one saw on the face of Hitler in the photographs in which he was supposed to be smiling. Vindictive laughter goes along with seeing oneself as triumphant over other selves, rather than being an indication of a new step in the achievement of one's own selfhood. Vindictive laughter, as well as the quantitative laughter of the laughing gas variety, reflects the humor of people who have, to a great extent, lost the sense of the dignity and significance of persons. The loss of the sense of the significance and worth of the self indeed will be one of the major stumbling blocks for some listeners in following the discussion throughout this book. Many persons, sophisticated as often as unsophisticated ones, have lost their conviction of how crucially important the problem of rediscovering the sense of self is. They still assume that being oneself means only what self-expression meant in the 1920s, and they may then ask, with some justification on the basis of their assumptions, 
would not being oneself be both unethical and boring? And does one have to express oneself in playing Chopin? Such questions themselves are evidence of how far the profound meaning of being oneself has been lost. Thus, many people in our day find it almost impossible to realize that Socrates, in his precept Know Thyself, was urging upon the individual the most difficult challenge of all. And they likewise find it almost impossible to understand what Kierkegaard meant when he proclaimed, To venture in the highest sense is precisely to become conscious of oneself. The Loss of Our Language for Personal Communication Along with the loss of the sense of self has gone a loss of our language for communicating deeply personal meanings to each other. This is one important side of the loneliness now experienced by people in the Western world. Take the word love, for example, a word which obviously should be most important in conveying personal feelings. When you use it, the person you are talking to may think you mean Hollywood love, or the sentimental emotion of the popular songs, I love my baby, my baby loves me, or religious charity, or friendliness, or sexual impulse, or what not. The same is true about almost any other important word in the non-technical areas. Truth, integrity, courage, spirit, freedom, and even the word self. Most people have private connotations for such words which may be quite different from their neighbor's meaning, and hence some people even try to avoid using such words. We have an excellent vocabulary for technical subjects, as Eric Fromm has pointed out. Almost every man can name the parts of an automobile engine clearly and definitely. But when it comes to meaningful interpersonal relations, our language is lost. We stumble and are practically as isolated as deaf and dumb people who can only communicate in sign language. As Eliot has his hollow men phrase it, Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass, or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. This loss of the effectiveness of language, it may seem strange to point out, is a symptom of a disrupted historical period. When you explore the rise and fall of historical eras, you will note how the language is powerful and compelling at certain times, like the Greek language of the 5th century BC, in which Aeschylus and Sophocles wrote their classics, or like the Elizabethan English of Shakespeare and the King James translation of the Bible. At other periods, the language is weak, vague and uncompelling, such as when Greek culture was being disrupted and dispersed in the Hellenistic period. I believe it could be shown in researches, which obviously cannot be gone into here, that when a culture is in its historical phase of growing toward unity, its language reflects the unity and power, whereas when a culture is in the process of change, dispersal, and disintegration, the language likewise loses its power. When I was eighteen, Germany was eighteen, said Goethe, referring not only to the fact that the ideals of his nation were then moving toward unity and power, but that the language which was his vehicle of power as a writer was also in that stage. In our day the study of semantics is of considerable value, to be sure, and is to be commended. But the disturbing question is why we have to talk so much about what words mean that, once we have learned each other's language, we have little time or energy left for communicating. There are other forms of personal communication than words. Art and music, for example. Painting and music are the voices of the sensitive spokesmen in the society communicating deeply personal meanings to others in the society, as well as to other societies and other historical periods. Again, we find in modern art and modern music a language which does not communicate. If most people, even intelligent ones, look at modern art without knowing the esoteric key, they can understand practically nothing. They are greeted by every kind of style, impressionism, expressionism, cubism, abstractionism, representationalism, non-objective painting, until Mondrian gives his message only in squares and rectangles, and Jackson Pollock in a kind of reductio ad absurdum 
spatters paint in almost accidental forms on large boards and entitles the work simply the date on which it was completed. I, of course, imply no criticism of these artists, both of whom happen to give me pleasure, but does it not imply something very significant about our society that talented artists can communicate only in such limited language? If you visit the Art Students League in New York, which has perhaps the largest group of outstanding American artists as teachers and the most representative body of students, you will be surprised to find the classes in practically every studio painting in a distinctly different style, and you will have to shift emotional gears every twenty steps. In the Renaissance, a common man could look at the paintings of Raphael or Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo and feel that the picture was telling him something which he could understand about life in general and his own inner life in particular. But if an untutored man walked through the galleries on 57th Street in New York City today and saw, let us say, exhibits by Picasso, Dali, and Marin, he might well agree that something important was being communicated, but he would no doubt aver that only God and the artist knew what it was. For his own part, he would probably be bewildered and possibly somewhat irritated. Nietzsche said a person is to be known by his style, that is, by the unique pattern which gives underlying unity and distinctiveness to his activities. The same is partly true about a culture. But when we ask what is the style of our day, we find that there is no style which can be called modern. The one thing these many modern different movements in art have in common— beginning with the great work of Cezanne and Van Gogh, is that they all are trying desperately to break through the hypocrisy and sentimentality of nineteenth-century art. Consciously or unconsciously, they seek to speak in their painting from some solid reality in the self-experiencing the world. But beyond this desperate search for honesty, which is much like that of Freud and Ibsen in their respective fields, there is only a potpourri of styles— making all necessary qualifications for the fact that time has not yet done its sifting for the modern period as it has, say, for the Renaissance, it is still true that this potpourri is a revealing picture of the disunity of our times. The pictures that are discordant and empty, as are so many in modern art, are thus honest portrayals of the condition of our time. It is as though every genuine artist were frantically trying different languages to see which one would communicate the music of form and color to his fellow men. But there is no common language. We find a giant like Picasso shifting in his own lifetime from style to style, partly as a reflection of the shifting character of the last four decades in Western society— and partly like a man dialing a ship's radio on the ocean, trying vainly to find the wavelength on which he can talk to his fellow men. But the artists, and the rest of us too, remain spiritually isolated and at sea, and so we cover up our loneliness by chattering with other people about the things we do have language for, the World Series, business affairs, the latest news reports. Our deeper emotional experiences are pushed further away, and we tend, thus, to become emptier and lonelier. Little we see in nature that is ours. People who have lost the sense of their identity as selves also tend to lose their sense of relatedness to nature. They lose not only their experience of organic connection with inanimate nature, such as trees and mountains, but they also lose some of their capacity to feel empathy for animate nature, that is, animals. In psychotherapy, persons who feel empty are often sufficiently aware of what a vital response to nature might be to know what they are missing. They may remark regretfully that though others are moved by a sunset, they themselves are left relatively cold, and though others may find the ocean majestic and awesome, they themselves, standing on rocks at the seashore, don't feel much of anything. Our relation to nature tends to be destroyed not only by our emptiness, but also by our anxiety. A little girl coming home from school after a lecture on how to defend oneself against the atom bomb asked her parent, Mother, can't we move someplace where there isn't any sky? 
Fortunately, this child's terrifying but revealing question is an allegory more than an illustration, but it well symbolizes how anxiety makes us withdraw from nature. Modern man, so afraid of the bombs he has built, must cower from the sky and hide in caves, must cower from the sky which is classically the symbol of vastness, imagination, release. On a more everyday level, our point is simply that when a person feels himself inwardly empty, as is the case with so many modern people, he experiences nature around him also as empty, dried up, dead. The two experiences of emptiness are two sides of the same state of impoverished relation to life. We can see more clearly what it means to lose one's feeling for nature if we glance back to note how the sense of relationship to nature flourished in the modern period, and then died down. One of the chief characteristics of the Renaissance in Europe was an upsurging of enthusiasm for nature in all its forms, whether in the form of animals or of trees or in the inanimate form of stars and colors in the sky. One can see this new feeling coming beautifully to life in the paintings of Giotto in the early Renaissance. If, after looking at the stylized and stiff forms of nature in medieval art, you suddenly come upon the frescoes of Giotto, you will be surprised by the most charming sheep, lively dogs, and winsome donkeys, all presented as vital parts of the human experience. And you will likewise be surprised to see that Giotto, in contrast to the artists of the Middle Ages, paints rocks and trees as natural forms delightful for their own beauty, not simply for their symbolic religious message, and that also in contrast to medieval art, he shows human beings experiencing joy, grief, contentment as individual emotions. His paintings tell us more powerfully than words that when a human being experiences himself as an identity who actively feels his relation to life as an individual, he also experiences an alive relation to animals and nature. The new appreciation of nature was also shown in the Renaissance enthusiasm for the human body. One can see this in many forms, in the sensuality in Boccaccio's stories, in the heroically powerful and harmonious bodies in Michelangelo's paintings, and in the feeling for the physical as part of the many-sided organic approach to life in Shakespeare's dramas. It was shown, furthermore, in the new enthusiasm for the scientific study of nature. One aspect, thus, of the strength of these towering individuals of the Renaissance, those universal men, was their strong feeling for nature. But by the nineteenth century, the interest in nature had become increasingly technical. Man's concern now was chiefly to master and manipulate nature. The world had become disenchanted in Paul Tillich's colorful phrase. To be sure, the disenchantment process had begun way back in the seventeenth century when Descartes taught that the body and mind were to be separated, that the objective world of physical nature and the body, which could be measured and weighed, was radically different from the subjective world of man's mind and inner experience. The practical result of this dichotomy was that the subjective inner experience, the mind side of the dichotomy, tended to be put on the shelf, and modern man had a heyday pursuing with great success the mechanical, measurable aspects of experience. So by the nineteenth century, nature had become impersonal, as in science, or an object to be calculated for the purpose of making money, as the geographer charts the seas for the purposes of commerce. Obviously, when we point out that the overemphasis on things which could be calculated and manipulated went hand in hand with the growth of industrialism and bourgeois commerce, we are implying no criticism of machines and technical progress as such. We mean simply to point out the historical fact that in this development nature became separated from the individual's subjective emotional life. Near the beginning of the nineteenth century, William Wordsworth, among others, clearly saw this loss of the feeling for nature, and he saw the overemphasis on commercialism, which was partly its cause, and the emptiness which would be its result. He described what was occurring in his familiar sonnet. 
The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours, we have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so I might, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. It is not by poetic accident that Wordsworth yearns for such mythological creatures as Proteus and Triton. These figures are personifications of aspects of nature. Proteus, the god who keeps changing his shape and form, is a symbol for the sea which is eternally transforming its movement and its color. Triton is the god whose horn is the seashell, and his music is the echoing hum one hears in the large shells on the shore. Proteus and Triton are examples of precisely what we have lost, namely the capacity to see ourselves and our moods in nature, to relate to nature as a broad and rich dimension of our own experience. Descartes' dichotomy had given modern man a philosophical basis for getting rid of the belief in witches, and this contributed considerably to the actual overcoming of witchcraft in the eighteenth century. Everyone would agree that this was a great gain, but we likewise got rid of the fairies, elves, trolls, and all of the demi-creatures of the woods and earth. It is generally assumed that this, too, was a gain since it helped sweep man's mind clean of superstition and magic. But I believe this is an error. Actually, what we did in getting rid of the fairies and the elves and their ilk was to impoverish our lives, and impoverishment is not the lasting way to clear men's minds of superstition— there is a sound truth in the old parable of the man who swept the evil spirit out of his house, but the spirit, noticing that the house stood clean and vacant, returned, bringing seven more evil spirits with him. And the second state of the man was worse than the first. For it is the empty and vacant people who seize on the new and more destructive forms of our latter-day superstitions, such as beliefs in the totalitarian mythologies, engrams, Miracles like the day the sun stood still, and so on. Our world has become disenchanted, and it leaves us not only out of tune with nature, but with ourselves as well. As human beings, we have our roots in nature, not simply because of the fact that the chemistry of our bodies is of essentially the same elements as the air or dirt or grass. In a multitude of other ways, we participate in nature. The rhythm of the change of seasons, or of night and day, for example, is reflected in the rhythm of our bodies, of hunger and fulfillment, of sleep and wakefulness, of sexual desire and gratification, and in countless other ways. Proteus can be a personification of the changes in the sea because he symbolizes what we and the sea share, changing moods, variety, capriciousness, and adaptability. In this sense, when we relate to nature, we are but putting our roots back into their native soil. But in another respect, man is very different from the rest of nature. He possesses consciousness of himself. His sense of personal identity distinguishes him from the rest of the living or non-living things. And nature cares not a fig for man's personal identity— that crucial point in our relatedness to nature brings into the center of the picture the basic theme of this book, man's need for awareness of himself. One must be able to affirm his person despite the impersonality of nature and to fill the silences of nature with his own inner aliveness. It takes a strong self, that is, a strong sense of personal identity, to relate fully to nature without being swallowed up. For really to feel the silence and the inorganic character of nature carries a considerable threat. 
If one stands on a rocky promontory, for example, and looks at the sea in its tremendous rising and falling of swells, and if one is fully and realistically aware that the sea never has a tear for others' woes nor cares what any other thinks, that one's life could be swallowed up with scarcely an infinitesimal difference being made to the tremendous ongoing chemical movement of creation, one is threatened. Or if one gives himself to the feeling of the distance of the far mountain peaks, permits himself to empathize with their heights and depths, and if one is aware at the same moment that the mountain never was the friend of one nor promised what it could not give, and that one could be dashed to pieces on the stone floor at the foot of the peak without his extinction as a person making the slightest difference to the walls of granite, one is afraid. This is the profound threat of nothingness or non-being which one experiences when he fully confronts his relation with inorganic being, and to remind oneself, dust thou art, to dust returnest, is hollow comfort indeed. Such experiences in relating to nature have too much anxiety for most people. They flee from the threat by shutting off their imagination, by turning their thoughts to the practical and humdrum details of what to have for lunch, or they protect themselves from the full terror of the threat of non-being by making the sea a person who wouldn't hurt them, or by taking refuge in some belief in individual providence and telling themselves, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. But to flee from one's anxiety, or to rationalize one's way out of it, only makes one weaker in the long run. It requires, we have said, a strong sense of self and a good deal of courage to relate to nature creatively. But to affirm one's own identity over against the inorganic being of nature in turn produces greater strength of self. At this point, however, we are getting ahead of our story. How such strength is developed belongs to the discussion in later chapters. We wish here only to emphasize that the loss of the relation to nature goes hand in hand with the loss of the sense of one's own self. Little we see in nature that is ours, as a description of many modern people, is a mark of the weakened and impoverished person. THE LOSS OF THE SENSE OF TRAGEDY A final consequence and evidence of the loss of our conviction of the worth and dignity of the person is that we have lost the sense of the tragic significance of human life. For the sense of tragedy is simply the other side of one's belief in the importance of the human individual. Tragedy implies a profound respect for the human being and a devotion to his rights and destiny— Otherwise, it just doesn't matter whether Orestes or Lear or you or I fall or stand in our struggles. Arthur Miller, in the preface to his play The Death of a Salesman, makes some telling comments on the lack of tragedy in our day. The tragic character, he writes, is one who is ready to lay down his life, if need be, to secure one thing, his sense of personal dignity. And the tragic right is a condition of life, a condition in which the human personality is able to flower and realize itself. These conditions obtained in the periods in Western history when great tragedy was written. One has only to look at 5th century Greece when Aeschylus and Sophocles wrote the mighty tragedies of Oedipus, Agamemnon, and Orestes, or at Elizabethan England when Shakespeare gave us Lear and Hamlet and Macbeth. But in our age of emptiness, tragedies are relatively rare, or, if they are written, the tragic aspect is the very fact that human life is so empty, as in Eugene O'Neill's drama, The Iceman Cometh. This play is set in a saloon, and its dramatis personae, alcoholics, prostitutes, and, as the chief character, a man who in the course of the play goes psychotic, can dimly recall the periods in their lives when they did believe in something. It is this echo of human dignity in a great void of emptiness that gives this drama the power to elicit the emotions of pity and terror of classical tragedy. Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, which we have mentioned earlier, is itself one of the few real tragedies about the common people, 
neither alcoholics nor psychotics, who make up the social situation in this country out of which most of us have sprung. In the movie version of this drama, Willie Loman, the salesman, is unfortunately made to look pathetic. Those who saw only the movie may have to imagine Willie in a broader context to appreciate his real tragic import. He was a man who took seriously the teachings of his society, that success should attend hard, energetic work, that economic progress is a reality, and that if one has the right contacts, achievement and salvation should follow. It is easy enough from our later perspective to see through Willie's illusions and to poke fun at his unsound go-getter values. But that is not the point. The one thing that matters is that Willie believed. He took seriously his own existence and what he had been taught he could rightly expect from life. I don't say he is a great man, says his wife, describing Willie's disintegration to their sons. But he's a human being, and a terrible thing is happening to him, so attention must be paid. The tragic fact is not that Willie is a man of the grandeur of Lear or the inward richness of Hamlet. He's only a little boat looking for a harbor, as his wife also says. But it is the tragedy of a historical period, if one multiplies Willie by the hundreds of thousands of fathers and brothers who also believed what they were taught but found in the changing times that it did not work, one has enough to shake one with pity and fear as in the tragedies of old. He never knew who he was, and he was one who took seriously his right to know. The flaw or crack in the tragic character, Miller writes, is really nothing and need be nothing, but his inherent unwillingness to remain passive in the face of what he conceives to be a challenge to his dignity, his image of his rightful status. Only the passive, only those who accept their lot without active retaliation, are flawless. Most of us are in that category. Miller goes on to point out that the quality in a tragedy which shakes us derives from the underlying fear of being displaced, the disaster inherent in being torn away from our chosen image of what and who we are in this world. Among us today, this fear is as strong and perhaps stronger than it ever was. Let no one assume we are advocating a pessimistic view when we mourn the loss of the tragic sense— on the contrary, as Miller also notes, tragedy implies more optimism in its author than does comedy, and its final result ought to be the reinforcement of the onlooker's brightest opinions of the human animal. For the tragic view indicates that we take seriously man's freedom and his need to realize himself. It demonstrates our belief in the indestructible will of man to achieve his humanity. The knowledge of human nature and the insights into man's unconscious conflicts which are disclosed in psychotherapy give new ground for believing in the tragic aspects of human life. The psychotherapist, privileged to be an intimate witness to some person's inner wrestling and their often grave and bitter struggles with themselves and with external forces which challenge their dignity, gains a new respect for these persons— and a new realization of the potential dignity of the human being. Countless times a week, furthermore, he receives proof in his consulting work that when men at last accept the fact that they cannot successfully lie to themselves, and at last learn to take themselves seriously, they discover previously unknown and often remarkable recuperative powers within themselves. The picture of the roots of the malady of our time given in this chapter adds up to a bleak diagnosis, but it does not necessarily imply a bleak prognosis. For the positive side is that we have no choice but to move ahead. We are like people part way through psychoanalysis whose defenses and illusions are broken through and their only choice is to push on to something better. We, and by we I mean everyone, however old or young, who is aware of the historical situation in which we live, are not the lost generation of the 1920s. The term lost when applied to members of that period of adolescent rebellion following the First World War meant that one was temporarily away from home, 
and could go back again whenever one became too frightened at being on one's own. But we are, rather, the generation which cannot turn back. We in the middle of the twentieth century are like pilots in the transatlantic flight who have passed the point of no return, who do not have fuel enough to go back, but must push on regardless of storms or other dangers. What, then, is the task before us? The implications are clear in that analysis. We must rediscover the sources of strength and integrity within ourselves. This, of course, goes hand in hand with the discovery and affirmations of values in ourselves and in our society, which will serve as the core of unity. But no values are effective in a person or a society, except as there exists in the person the prior capacity to do the valuing, that is, the capacity actively to choose and affirm the values by which he lives. This the individual must do, and in this way he will help lay the groundwork for the new constructive society which will eventually come out of this disturbed time, as the Renaissance came out of the disintegration of the Middle Ages. William James once remarked that those who are concerned with making the world more healthy had best start with themselves. We could go farther and point out that finding the center of strength within ourselves is, in the long run, the best contribution we can make to our fellow men. It is said that when the fisherman in the sea around Norway sees his boat heading for a maelstrom, he reaches ahead to try to throw an oar into the boiling whirlpool. If he can do so, the maelstrom quiets down, and he and his boat go safely through. Just so, one person with indigenous inner strength exercises a great calming effect on panic among people around him. This is what our society needs, not new ideas and inventions, important as these are, and not geniuses and supermen, but persons who can be, that is, persons who have a center of strength within themselves. It is our task in these chapters to try to find the sources of this inner strength. Part 2. Rediscovering Selfhood 3. The Experience of Becoming a Person To undertake this venture of becoming aware of ourselves and to discover the sources of inner strength and security which are the rewards of such a venture, let us start at the beginning by asking, what is this person, this sense of selfhood we seek? A few years ago, a psychologist procured a baby chimpanzee the same age as his infant son. In order to do an experiment, such as is the want of these men, he raised the baby chimp and baby human being in his household together. For the first few months, they developed at very much the same speed, playing together and showing very little difference. But after a dozen months or so, a change began to occur in the development of the little human baby, and from then on there was a great difference between him and the chimp. This is what we would expect, for there is very little difference between the human being and any mammal baby from the time of the original unity of the fetus in the womb of its mother through the beginning of the beating of its own heart, then its ejection as an infant from the womb at birth, the commencing of its own breathing, and the first protected months of life. But around the age of two, more or less, there appears in the human being the most radical and important emergence so far in evolution, namely, his consciousness of himself. He begins to be aware of himself as an I. As the fetus in the womb, the infant has been part of the original we with its mother, and it continues as part of the psychological we in early infancy. But now the little child, for the first time, becomes aware of his freedom. He senses his freedom, as Gregory Bateson puts it, within the context of the relationship with his father and mother. He experiences himself as an identity who is separated from his parents and can stand against them if need be. This remarkable emergence is the birth of the human animal into a person. Consciousness of Self 
the unique mark of man. This consciousness of self, this capacity to see one's self as though from the outside, is the distinctive characteristic of man. A friend of mine has a dog who waits at his studio door all morning, and when anybody comes to the door, he jumps up and barks, wanting to play. My friend holds that the dog is saying in his barking, Here is a dog who has been waiting all morning for someone to come to play with him. Are you the one? This is a nice sentiment, and all of us who like dogs enjoy projecting such cozy thoughts into their heads. But actually, this is exactly what the dog cannot say. He can show that he wants to play and entice you into throwing his ball for him, but he cannot stand outside himself and see himself as a dog doing these things. He is not blessed with the consciousness of self. Inasmuch as this means the dog is also free from neurotic anxiety and guilt feelings, which are the doubtful blessings of the human being, some people would prefer to say the dog is not cursed with the consciousness of self. Walt Whitman, echoing this thought, envies the animals. I think I could turn and live with animals. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. But actually, man's consciousness of himself is the source of his highest qualities. It underlies his ability to distinguish between I and the world. It gives him the capacity to keep time, which is simply the ability to stand outside the present and to imagine oneself back in yesterday or ahead in the day after tomorrow. Thus, human beings can learn from the past and plan for the future. And thus is man the historical mammal, in that he can stand outside and look at his history, and thereby he can influence his own development as a person, and, to a minor extent, he can influence the march of history in his nation and society as a whole. The capacity for consciousness of self also underlies man's ability to use symbols, which is a way of disengaging something from what it is, such as the two sounds which make up the word table, and agreeing that these sounds will stand for a whole class of things. Thus, man can think in abstractions like beauty, reason, and goodness. This capacity for consciousness of ourselves gives us the ability to see ourselves as others see us and to have empathy with others. It underlies our remarkable capacity to transport ourselves into someone else's parlor where we will be in reality next week and then in imagination to think and plan how we will act and it enables us to imagine ourselves in someone else's place and to ask how we would feel and what we would do if we were this other person. No matter how poorly we use or fail to use or even abuse these capacities, they are the rudiments of our ability to begin to love our neighbor, to have ethical sensitivity, to see truth, to create beauty, to devote ourselves to ideals and to die for them if need be. To fulfill these potentialities is to be a person. This is what is meant when it is stated in the Hebrew Christian religious tradition that man is created in the image of God. But these gifts come only at a high price, the price of anxiety and inward crises. The birth of the self is no simple and easy matter, for the child now faces the frightful prospect of being out on his own, alone, and without the full protection of the decisions of his parents. It is no wonder that when he begins to feel himself an identity in his own right, he may feel terribly powerless in comparison with the great and strong adults around him. In the midst of a struggle over her dependency on her mother, one person had this eloquent dream. I was in a little boat tied to a big boat. We were going through the ocean, and big waves came up, piling over the sides of my boat. I wondered whether it was still tied to the big boat. The healthy child who is loved and supported but not coddled by his parents will proceed in his development despite this anxiety and the crises that face him, and there may be no particular external signs of trauma or special rebelliousness. But when his parents consciously or 
unconsciously exploit him for their own ends or pleasure, or hate or reject him so that he cannot be sure of minimal support when he tries out his new independence, the child will cling to the parents and will use his capacity for independence only in the forms of negativity and stubbornness. If, when he first begins tentatively to say no, his parents beat him down rather than love and encourage him, he thereafter will say no not as a form of true independent strength, but as a mere rebellion. Or if, in the majority of cases in the present day, the parents themselves are anxious and bewildered in the tumultuous seas of the changing times, unsure of themselves and beset by self-doubts, their anxiety will carry over and lead the child to feel that he lives in a world in which it is dangerous to venture into becoming oneself. This brief sketch is schematic, to be sure, and it is meant to give us as adults a kind of retrospective picture in the light of which we can better understand how one fails to achieve selfhood. Most of the data for these conflicts of childhood come from adults who are struggling in dreams, memories, or in present-day relations to overcome what in their past lives originally blocked them in becoming fully born as persons. Almost every adult is, in greater or lesser degree, still struggling on the long journey to achieve selfhood on the basis of the patterns which were set in his early experiences in the family. Nor do we for a moment overlook the fact that selfhood is always born in a social context. Genetically, Auden is quite right. For the ego is a dream, till a neighbor's need by name create it. Or, as we put it before, the self is always born and grows in interpersonal relationships. But no ego moves on into responsible selfhood if it remains chiefly the reflection of the social context around it. In our particular world in which conformity is the great destroyer of selfhood, in our society in which fitting the pattern tends to be accepted as the norm and being well-liked is the alleged ticket to salvation, what needs to be emphasized is not only the admitted fact that we are to some extent created by each other, but also our capacity to experience and create ourselves. On the very day I was writing these words, a young intern reported in his psychoanalytic session a dream which is essentially parallel to the dreams of almost everyone who is in a crisis in his growth. This young man had originally come for psychoanalytic help as a medical student because of attacks of anxiety so severe and prolonged that he was on the verge of dropping out of medical school. His problems were chiefly due to his close tie to his mother, a very unstable but strong and dominating woman. Having by now completed his medical studies, he was a successful intern and had applied for the most responsible residency in the hospital for the next year. The day preceding the night on which he had this dream, he had received a letter from the hospital directors awarding him the residency and paying him compliments on his excellent work as an intern. But instead of being pleased, he had been suddenly seized with an attack of anxiety. The dream follows in his own words. I was bicycling to my childhood home where my father and mother were. The place seemed beautiful. When I went in, I felt free and powerful as I am in my real life as a doctor now, not as I was as a boy. But my mother and father would not recognize me. I was afraid to express my independence for fear I would be kicked out. I felt as lonely and separate as though I were at the North Pole and there were no people around but only snow and ice for thousands of miles. I walked through the house and in the different rooms were signs tacked up, wipe your feet and clean your hands. The anxiety after his being offered the desired position indicates that something in it or in the responsibility it entailed very much frightened him and the dream tells us why. If he is a responsible, independent person in his own right, in contrast to the boy tied to his mother's apron strings, he will be ejected from his family and will be isolated and alone. The fascinating vignettes in the form of the wipe-your-feet signs add a footnote which says the house is like a military camp and not a loving home at all.
The real question facing this young man, of course, was why he dreamed of going home at all. What need was there within himself to go back to mother and father and the house he pictured as externally beautiful in the dream when he is confronted with responsibility? This is a question we shall deal with later. Here, let us only emphasize how becoming a person, an identity in one's own right, is the original development which begins in infancy and carries over into adulthood, no matter how old one may be. And the crises it involves may cause tremendous anxiety. No wonder many persons repress the conflict and try all their lives to run from the anxiety. What does it mean to experience one's self as a self? The experience of our own identity is the basic conviction that we all start with as psychological beings. It can never be proven in a logical sense, for consciousness of oneself is the presupposition of any discussion about it. There will always be an element of mystery in one's awareness of one's own being. Mystery here meaning a problem, the data of which encroach on the problem. For such awareness is a presupposition of inquiry into oneself. That is to say, even to meditate on one's own identity as a self means that one is already engaging in self-consciousness. Some psychologists and philosophers are distrustful of the concept of self. They argue against it because they do not like separating man from the continuum with animals, and they believe the concept of the self gets in the way of scientific experimentation. But rejecting the concept of self as unscientific because it cannot be reduced to mathematical equations is roughly the same as the argument two and three decades ago that Freud's theories and the concept of unconscious motivation were unscientific. It is a defensive and dogmatic science, and therefore not true science, which uses a particular scientific method as a procrustean bed and rejects all forms of human experience which don't fit. To be sure, the continuum between man and animals should be seen clearly and realistically. But one need not jump to the unwarranted conclusion that, therefore, there is no distinction between man and animals. We do not need to prove the self as an object. It is only necessary that we show how people have the capacity for self-relatedness. The self is the organizing function within the individual and the function by means of which one human being can relate to another. It is prior to, not an object of, our science. It is presupposed in the fact that one can be a scientist. Human experience always goes beyond our particular methods of understanding it at any given moment, and the best way to understand one's identity as a self is to look into one's own experience. Let us, for example, imagine the inner experience of some psychologist or philosopher writing a paper to deny the concept of consciousness of self. During the weeks he was considering writing this paper, he no doubt many times pictured himself sitting at his desk at some future day writing away, and from time to time, let us say, both before he actually began to write and later as he sat at his desk at work on the paper, he considered in fantasy what his colleagues would say about the paper, whether Professor So-and-so would praise it, whether other colleagues would say how brilliant this is, whether still others might think it stupid, and so on. In every thought he is seeing himself as an identity as definitely as he would see a colleague walking across the street. His every thought in the process of arguing against the consciousness of self proves this very consciousness in himself. The consciousness of one's identity as a self certainly is not an intellectual idea. The French philosopher Descartes at the beginning of the modern period three centuries ago crawled into his stove, according to legend, to meditate in solitude all one day, trying to find the basic principle of human existence. He came out of his stove in the evening with the famous conclusion, I think, therefore I am. That is to say, I exist as a self because I am a thinking creature. But that is not enough. You and I never think of ourselves as an idea. We rather picture ourselves as doing something, like the psychologist writing his paper. 
and we then experience in imagination the feelings that we will have when we are in actuality doing that thing. That is to say, we experience ourselves as a thinking, intuiting, feeling, and acting unity. The self is thus not merely the sum of the various roles one plays. It is the capacity by which one knows he plays these roles. It is the center from which one sees and is aware of these so-called different sides of himself. After these perhaps high-sounding phrases, let us remind ourselves that, after all, the experience of one's own identity or becoming a person is the simplest experience in life, even though at the same time the most profound. As everyone knows, a little child will react indignantly and strongly if you, in teasing, call him by the wrong name. It is as though you take away his identity, a most precious thing to him. In the Old Testament, the phrase, I will blot out their names, to erase their identity and it will be as though they never had existed, is a more powerful threat even than physical death. Two little girl twins gave a vivid illustration of how important it is for a child to be a person in her own right. The little girls were good friends, a fact made especially possible because they complemented each other. One being extrovert and always in the center of the crowd if people came to visit in the house, the other being perfectly happy by herself to draw with her crayons and make up little poems. The parents, as parents generally do with twins, had dressed them alike when they went out walking. When they were about three and a half, the little extrovert girl began to want always to wear a different kind of dress from her sister. If she dressed after her sister, she would even, if necessary, wear an older and less pretty dress so that it would not be the same as the twin was wearing. Or if the sister dressed after her before they went out, she would beg her, sometimes weeping, not to put on the matching dress. For days this puzzled the parents, since the child was not anxious in other ways. Finally the parents, on a hunch, asked the little girl, When you two go out walking, do you like to have the people on the street say, Look at these nice twins? Immediately the little girl exclaimed, No, I want them to say, Look at these two different people. This spontaneous exclamation, obviously revealing something very important to the little girl, cannot be explained by saying that the child wanted attention, for she would have gotten more attention if she had dressed as a twin. It shows, rather, her demand to be a person in her own right, to have personal identity, a need which was more important to her even than attention or prestige. The little girl rightly stated the goal for every human being, to become a person. Every organism has one and only one central need in life, to fulfill its own potentialities. The acorn becomes an oak, the puppy becomes a dog and makes the fond and loyal relations with its human masters which befit the dog, and this is all that is required of the oak tree and the dog. But the human being's task in fulfilling his nature is much more difficult, for he must do it in self-consciousness. That is, his development is never automatic, but must be to some extent chosen and affirmed by himself. Among the works of man, John Stuart Mill has written, which human life is rightly employed in perfecting and in beautifying, the first importance, surely, is man himself. Human nature is not a machine to be built after a model and set to do exactly the work prescribed for it, but a tree which requires to grow and develop itself on all sides according to the tendency of the inward forces which make it a living thing. In this charmingly expressed thought, John Stuart Mill has unfortunately omitted the most important tendency of the inward forces which make man a living thing. Namely, that man does not grow automatically like a tree, but fulfills his potentialities only as he, in his own consciousness, plans and chooses. Fortunately, the long protracted period of infancy and childhood in human life, in contrast to the condition of the acorn, which is on its own as soon as it falls to the soil, or of the puppy, which must fend for itself after a few weeks, prepares the child for this difficult task. 
he is able to acquire some knowledge and inner strength, so that as he must begin to choose and decide, he has some capability for it. Man, furthermore, must make his choices as an individual, for individuality is one side of one's consciousness of oneself. We can see this point clearly when we realize that consciousness of oneself is always a unique act. I can never know exactly how you see yourself, and you never can know exactly how I relate to myself. This is the inner sanctum where each man must stand alone. This fact makes for much of the tragedy and inescapable isolation in human life, but it also indicates again that we must find the strength in ourselves to stand in our own inner sanctum as individuals. And this fact means that since we are not automatically merged with our fellows, we must, through our own affirmation, learn to love each other. If any organism fails to fulfill its potentialities, it becomes sick, just as your legs would wither if you never walked. But the power of your legs is not all you would lose. The flowing of your blood, your heart action, your whole organism would be the weaker. And in the same way, if man does not fulfill his potentialities as a person, he becomes, to that extent, constricted and ill. This is the essence of neurosis, the person's unused potentialities, blocked by hostile conditions in the environment, past or present, and by his own internalized conflicts, turn inward and cause morbidity. Energy is eternal delight, said William Blake. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. Kafka was a master at the gruesome task of picturing people who do not use their potentialities and therefore lose their sense of being persons. The chief character in The Trial and in the Castle has no name. He is identified only by an initial, a mute symbol of one's lack of identity in one's own right. In the staggering and frightful parable Metamorphosis, Kafka illustrates what happens when the human being forfeits his powers. The hero of this story is a typical, empty, modern young man, who lives a routine, vacuous life as a salesman, returning regularly to his middle-class home, eating the same menu of roast beef every Sunday, while his father goes to sleep at the table. The young man's life was so empty, implies Kafka, that he woke up one morning no longer a human being, but a cockroach. Because he had not fulfilled his status as a man, he forfeited his human potentialities. A cockroach, like lice and rats and vermin, lives off others' leavings. It is a parasite and, in most people's minds, a symbol for what is unclean and repugnant. Could there be any more powerful symbol of what happens when a human being relinquishes his nature as a person? But to the extent that we do fulfill our potentialities as persons, we experience the profoundest joy to which the human being is heir. When a little child is learning to walk up steps or lift a box, he will try again and again, getting up when he falls down and starting over again. And finally, when he does succeed, he laughs with gratification, his expression of joy in the use of his powers. But this is nothing in comparison to the quiet joy when the adolescent can use his newly emerged power for the first time to gain a friend, or the adult's joy when he can love, plan, and create. Joy is the affect which comes when we use our powers. Joy, rather than happiness, is the goal of life, for joy is the emotion which accompanies our fulfilling our natures as human beings. It is based on the experience of one's identity as a being of worth and dignity, who is able to affirm his being, if need be, against all other beings and the whole inorganic world. This power in its ideal form is shown in the life of a Socrates, who was so confident in himself and his values that he could take his being condemned to death not as a defeat, but as a greater fulfillment than compromising his beliefs. But we do not wish to imply such joy is only for the heroic and the outstanding. It is present qualitatively in anyone's act, no matter how inconspicuous, which is done as an honest and responsible expression of his own powers. Self-Contempt, a Substitute for Self-Worth 
But here we must pause to answer two objections. Some listeners may be thinking that this emphasis on the necessity and value of consciousness of self will make people too concerned about themselves. One objection would be that it leads one to be too introspective, and another that it makes for pride in oneself. Persons with this latter objection might raise the questions, are we not told not to think too highly of ourselves, and has it not been proclaimed that man's pride in himself is the root of most evil in our time? Let us consider the latter objection first. To be sure, one ought not to think too highly of oneself, and a courageous humility is the mark of the realistic and mature person. But thinking too highly of oneself in the sense of self-inflation and conceit does not come from greater consciousness of oneself or greater feelings of self-worth. In fact, it comes from just the opposite. Self-inflation and conceit are generally the external signs of inner emptiness and self-doubt. A show of pride is one of the most common covers for anxiety. Pride was a chief characteristic of the famous Roaring Nineteen Twenties, but we now know that this period was one of widespread suppressed anxiety. The person who feels weak becomes a bully, the inferior person the braggart, a flexing of muscles, much talk, cockiness, and endeavor to brazen it out are the symptoms of covert anxiety in a person or a group. Tremendous pride was exhibited in fascism, as everyone knows who has seen the pictures of the strutting Mussolini and psychopathic Hitler. But fascism is a development in people who are empty, anxious, and despairing, and therefore seize on megalomaniac promises. To push this question deeper, many of the arguments in our day against pride in oneself and many of the homilies on alleged self-abnegation have a motive quite other than humility or a courageous facing of one's human situation. A great number of these arguments, for example, reveal a considerable contempt for the self. Aldous Huxley writes, For all of us, the most intolerably dreary and deadening life is that which we live with ourselves. Fortunately, it can be remarked immediately, this generalization is obviously untrue. It is empirically not a fact that the most dreary and deadening hours of Spinoza were those he lived with himself, or of Thoreau, or of Einstein, or of Jesus, or of many a human being who has no fame whatever, but who has ventured, as Kierkegaard puts it, to become conscious of himself. In fact, I seriously doubt whether Huxley's remark is true even of himself, or of Reinhold Niebuhr, or others who, with so much self-confidence and assertiveness, proclaim the evils of man's asserting himself. Indeed, it is very easy to get an audience these days if one preaches against conceit and pride in one's self, for most people feel so empty and convinced of their lack of worth anyway that they readily agree that the one who is condemning them must be right. This leads us to the most important point of all in understanding the dynamics of much modern self-condemnation, namely that condemning ourselves is the quickest way to get a substitute sense of worth. People who have almost but not quite lost their feeling of worth generally have very strong needs to condemn themselves, for that is the most ready way of drowning the bitter ache of feelings of worthlessness and humiliation. It is as though the person were saying to himself, I must be important that I am so worth condemning, or look how noble I am, I have such high ideals, and I am so ashamed of myself that I fall short. A psychoanalyst once pointedly remarked that when someone in psychoanalysis berates himself at great length for picayune sins, he feels like asking, who do you think you are? The self-condemning person is very often trying to show how important he is that God is so concerned with punishing him. Much self-condemnation, thus, is a cloak for arrogance. Those who think they overcome pride by condemning themselves could well ponder Spinoza's remark, One who despises himself is the nearest to a proud man. In ancient Athens, when a politician was trying to get the votes of the working class by appearing very humble in a tattered coat with big holes in it, 
Socrates unmasked his hypocrisy by exclaiming, Your vanity shows forth from every hole in your coat. The mechanism of much of this self-condemnation in our day can be observed in psychological depressions. The child, for example, who feels he is not loved by his parents can always say generally to himself, If I were different, if I were not bad, they would love me. By this means, he avoids facing the full force and the terror of the realization that he is not loved. Thus, too, with adults, if they can condemn themselves, they do not really need to feel the pain of their isolation or emptiness, and the fact that they are not loved then does not cast doubt upon their feeling of worth as persons. For they can always say, if it were not for such and such a sin or bad habit, I would be loved. In our age of hollow people, the emphasis upon self-condemnation is like whipping a sick horse. It achieves a temporary lift, but it hastens the eventual collapse of the dignity of the person. The self-condemning substitute for self-worth provides the individual with a method of avoiding an open and honest confronting of his problems of isolation and worthlessness, and makes for a pseudo-humility rather than the honest humility of one who seeks to face his situation realistically and do what he can constructively. Furthermore, the self-condemning substitute provides the individual with a rationalization for his self-hate, and thus reinforces the tendencies toward hating himself, and inasmuch as one's attitudes toward other selves generally parallel one's attitude towards oneself, one's covert tendency to hate others is also rationalized and reinforced. The steps are not big from the feeling of worthlessness of oneself to self-hatred to hatred for others. In the circles where self-contempt is preached, it is, of course, never explained why a person should be so ill-mannered and inconsiderate as to force his company on other people if he finds it so dreary and deadening himself. And furthermore, the multitude of contradictions are never adequately explained in a doctrine which advises that we should hate the one self, I, and love all others with the obvious expectation that they will love us, hateful creatures that we are, or that the more we hate ourselves, the more we love God who made the mistake in an off moment of creating this contemptible creature, I. Fortunately, however, we no longer have to argue that self-love is not only necessary and good, but that it also is a prerequisite for loving others. Eric Fromm, in his persuasive analysis, Selfishness and Self-Love, has made it clear that selfishness and excessive self-concern really come from an inner self-hatred. He points out that self-love is not only not the same as selfishness, but is actually the opposite to it. That is to say, the person who inwardly feels worthless is the one who must build himself up by selfish aggrandizement, and the person who has a sound experience of his own worth, that is, who loves himself, has the basis for acting generously toward his neighbor. Fortunately, it also becomes clear from a longer religious perspective that much contemporaneous self-condemning and self-contempt are a product of particular modern problems. Calvin's contemptuous view of the self was closely related to the fact that individuals felt so insignificant in the industrial developments of the modern period, and the twentieth-century self-contempt arises not only from Calvinism, but also from our disease of emptiness. Thus, the modern self-contemptuous emphasis is not representative of the long-term Hebrew Christian tradition. Kierkegaard has expressed this most forcibly— if anyone, therefore, will not learn from Christianity to love himself in the right way, then neither can he love his neighbor. To love oneself in the right way and to love one's neighbor are absolutely analogous concepts, are, at bottom, one and the same. Hence the law is, you shall love yourself as you love your neighbor when you love him as yourself. Consciousness of self is not introversion. The other objection we mentioned before may arise in the listener's mind in questions like these. Ought we not to try to forget ourselves? 
Does not consciousness of oneself make oneself conscious in the sense of being shy, embarrassed, and socially inhibited? Some questioners would no doubt mention the famous centipede, who came to grief because of too much thinking which leg came after which, and so lay distracted in the ditch. The moral of the centipede, obviously, is, see what happens to you if you get too conscious of what you are doing. Before answering these objections, we must point out how unfortunate it is that self-consciousness is identified in this country with morbid introspection, shyness, and embarrassment. Naturally, the last thing in the world anyone would want, then, is to be self-conscious. But our language plays tricks on us. The German language is more accurate in this regard. The word for self-consciousness also means self-confident, which is as it should be. An example will make clear that what we are talking about is just the opposite to shyness, embarrassment, and morbid introversion. A young man came for psychotherapy because, though he was intellectually very competent and seemed superficially to be very successful, his spontaneity was almost completely blocked. He could not love anyone, and he got no real enjoyment from human companionship. These problems were accompanied by a good deal of anxiety and recurrent depressions. It had always been his habit to stand outside himself, looking at himself, never letting himself go, until the self-concern became exceedingly painful. In listening to music, he was so concerned with how well he was listening that he would not hear the music. Even in making love, it was as though he were standing outside, watching himself and asking, how am I doing? As could be imagined, this put quite a crimp in his style. He was afraid when he entered psychotherapy and discovered that he would have to become more aware of what was going on within himself, that he would become more self-conscious, and therefore his problems would become worse. He was the only child of anxious parents who had very much overprotected him, never going out at night, for example, because of their hesitancy to leave him alone. Though the parents were ostensibly liberal and rational in all dealings with the son, he could never remember in all his childhood that he ever once talked back to them. The parents would brag about his achievements in school to relatives, cutting clippings about his successes from the papers, and taking pride in the fact that he was brighter than his cousins. But they rarely expressed real appreciation directly to him. Thus already as a child he was unable to develop a feeling of his own independent power and worth, and used as a substitute and over-concern for the praise which came at least indirectly from winning prizes in school. Add to this that he spent his early teens in Hitler, Germany, where he was exposed continuously to propaganda about his supposed worthlessness as a Jew— Thus his standing off and continually looking at himself as an adult was like continuing to cut clippings from the paper, judging and measuring himself, trying to prove to himself that the Nazis were not right, and trying to get genuine affirmation of himself as a person from his parents. This case is very much oversimplified, to be sure. We wish only to illustrate that this person's morbid self-consciousness and his inability to be spontaneous and wholehearted were connected precisely with the lack of consciousness of himself, precisely the lack of the experience that he was the acting I. To be merely an observer of oneself, to treat oneself as an object, is to be a stranger to oneself. The famous centipede is generally a rationalization used by those who do not wish to go through the difficult process of enlarging consciousness of themselves. Furthermore, it is not an accurate fable. The less aware you are of how to drive a car, for example, or of the traffic conditions you are driving through, the more tense you are and the firmer hold you have to keep on yourself. But on the other hand, the more experienced you are as a driver and the more conscious you are of the traffic problems and what to do in emergencies, the more you can relax at the wheel with a sense of power. You have the awareness that it is you who are doing the driving, you in control. Consciousness of self actually expands our control of our lives, and with that expanded power, 
comes the capacity to let ourselves go. This is the truth behind the seeming paradox that the more consciousness of oneself one has, the more spontaneous and creative one can be at the same time. To be sure, the advice to forget the childish self, the infantile self, is good advice, but it rarely does any good. It is true, furthermore, that one does in one sense forget oneself in creative activity, as we shall see in the next chapter. But first we must consider the difficult question of how one achieves consciousness of himself. The Experience of One's Body and Feelings In the achieving of consciousness of oneself, most people must start back at the beginning and rediscover their feelings— it is surprising how many people have only a general acquaintance with what they feel. They tell you they feel fine or lousy as vaguely as though they were saying China is in the Orient. Their connection with their feelings is as remote as if over a long-distance telephone. They do not feel directly, but only give ideas about their feelings. They are not affected by their affects. Their emotions give them no motion. Like Eliot's hollow men, they experience themselves as shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. In psychotherapy, when such persons are unable to experience their feelings, they often have to learn to feel by answering the question day after day, just how do I feel right now? What is most important is not how much one feels, and we certainly do not mean that it is necessary to effervesce. That is sentimentality rather than sentiment, affectation and not affect. Rather, what is important is the experience that it is I, the active one, who is doing the feeling. This carries with it a directness and immediacy of feeling. One experiences the affect on all levels of oneself one feels with a heightened aliveness. Then, instead of one's feelings being limited like notes in a bugle call, the mature person becomes able to differentiate feelings into as many nuances, strong and passionate experiences, or delicate and sensitive ones, as in the different passages of music in a symphony. This also means that we need to recover our awareness of our bodies— an infant gets part of his early sense of personal identity through awareness of his body. We may call the body as experienced by the infant, says Gardner Murphy, the first core of the self. The baby reaches his leg time and again, and sooner or later there is the experience, here is this leg, I can feel it and it belongs to me. Sexual feelings are particularly significant, because they are among the earliest feelings which the child can refer directly to himself. When sexual areas are stimulated in play or by clothing, there is the rudimentary beginning of the experience of feeling one's self. Unfortunately, sexual feelings and those connected with toilet experiences have been widely tabooed in the past in our society, and the child has been given to understand that such feelings are naughty. Since such feelings are a part of his way of identifying himself, the taboo would clearly imply, your image of yourself is dirty. This undoubtedly is one important part of the origin of the tendency to despise the self in our society. The ability to be aware of one's body has a great importance all through life. It is a curious fact that most adults have so lost physical awareness that they are unable to tell how their leg feels if you should ask them, or their ankle, or their middle finger, or any other part of the body. In our society, the awareness of the different parts of the body is generally limited to some borderline schizophrenics and other sophisticated people who have come under the influence of yoga or other Eastern exercises. Most people act on the principle, let hands or feet feel as they may, I must get off to work. As a result of several centuries of suppressing the body into an inanimate machine, subordinated to the purpose of modern industrialism, people are proud of paying no attention to the body. They treat it as an object for manipulation, as though it were a truck to be driven till it runs out of gas. 
The only concern they give it is a thought each week as perfunctory as a phone call to a relative to ask how he is, but with really no intention of taking the answer seriously. Nature then comes along, if we may speak metaphorically, and knocks the person down with colds or the flu or more severe illnesses, as though she were saying, when will you learn to listen to your body? The impersonal, separated attitude toward the body is shown also in the way most people, once they become physically ill, react to the sickness. They speak in the passive voice, I got sick, picturing their body as an object just as they would say, I got hit by a car. Then they shrug their shoulders and regard their responsibility fulfilled if they go to bed and place themselves completely in the hands of the doctor and the new medical miracle drugs. Thus they use scientific progress as a rationalization for passivity. They know how germs or virus or allergies attack the body, and they also know how penicillin or sulfa or some other drug cures them. The attitude toward disease is not that of the self-aware person who experiences his body as part of himself, but of the compartmentalized person who might express his passive attitude in a sentence like, The pneumococcus made me sick, but penicillin made me well again. Certainly, it is only common sense to avail oneself of all the help science can give, but that is no reason to surrender one's own sovereignty over one's body. When one does surrender autonomy, one opens oneself to psychosomatic ills of all sorts. Many disturbances of bodily function, beginning in such simple things as incorrect walking or faulty posture or breathing, are due to the fact that people have all their lives walked, to take only one simple illustration, as though they were machines, and have never experienced any of the feelings in their feet or legs or rest of the body. The correcting of the malfunction of one's legs, for example, often requires that one learn again to feel what is happening when one walks. In overcoming psychosomatic ills or chronic diseases like tuberculosis, it is essential to learn to listen to the body in deciding when to work and when to rest. It is amazing how many hints and guides and intuitions for living come to the sensitive person who has ears to hear what his body is saying. To be tuned to the responses throughout one's body, as well as to be tuned to one's feelings and emotional relations with the world and people around him, is to be on the way to a health which will not break down periodically. Not only do people separate the body from the self in using it as an instrument for work, but they likewise separate it from the self in their pursuit of pleasure. The body is treated as a vehicle of sensation from which one can get certain gastronomical pleasures and sexual sensations if skillfully handled, just as though one were tuning a television set. The detached attitude toward sex, which we already noted in a previous chapter, is connected with this tendency to separate the body from the rest of the self. The Kinsey Report speaks of the sexual partner as a sexual object, and in the same vein, many persons think in terms of my sexual needs require some outlet, rather than I want and choose sexual relations with this particular person. The tendency to separate sexual activity from the rest of the self is, as everyone knows, illustrated on one hand by the Puritan attitudes. But it is not so widely realized that libertinism, the opposite to Puritanism, commits exactly the same error of separating sex from the self. We are proposing welcoming the body back into the union with the self. This means, as already suggested, recovering an active awareness of one's body. It means experiencing one's body, the pleasure of eating or resting or the exhilaration of using toned-up muscles or the gratification of sexual impulses and passion, as aspects of the acting self. It is not the attitude of, my body feels, but I feel. In sex, it is the attitude of experiencing sexual desire and passion as one aspect of interpersonal relationships. Separating sex from the rest of the self, indeed, is no more tenable than to isolate one's larynx and speak of, my vocal cords wanting to talk with my friend. We propose, furthermore, 
placing the self in the center of the picture of bodily health. It is I who grow sick or achieve health. We propose the active rather than passive voice in illness. The old expression, I sicken, is accurate. Fortunately, in at least one disease, the active verb is still used for the process of getting well. Tuberculosis patients say, I cured at such and such a sanatorium. We propose that illnesses, whether physical or psychological, be taken not as periodic accidents which occur to the body or to the personality or mind, but as nature's means of re-educating the whole person. Using illness as a re-education is illustrated in a letter a patient with tuberculosis wrote to a friend. The disease occurred not simply because I overworked or ran athwart some TB bugs, but because I was trying to be something I wasn't. I was living as the great extrovert, running here and there, doing three jobs at once, and leaving undeveloped and unused the side of me which would contemplate, would read and think and invite my soul, rather than rushing and working at full speed. The disease comes as a demand and an opportunity to rediscover the lost functions of myself. It is as though the disease were nature's way of saying, you must become your whole self. To the extent that you do not, you will be ill, and you will become well only to the extent that you do become yourself. We may add that it is an actual clinical fact that some persons, viewing their illnesses as an opportunity for re-education, become more healthy both psychologically and physically, more fulfilled as persons after a serious illness than before. This way of experiencing illness and health will help us overcome the dichotomy between body and mind which has so bedeviled modern man. When one looks at the different illnesses from the perspective of the self, he sees that physical, psychological, and spiritual, using the last term to refer to despair and the sense of meaninglessness in life, diseases are all aspects of the same difficulty of the self in finding itself in its world. It is well known, for example, that the different kinds of illness may serve interchangeable purposes for the individual. Physical illnesses may relieve psychological troubles by giving some focus for floating anxiety. The person then has something concrete to worry about, and that is a lot less painful than vague floating anxiety or by giving needed respite from the responsibility to those who have not learned to assume responsibility maturely. And many a person through a bout of influenza or more serious disease has relieved his guilt feelings, however unconstructive such a method may be. Thus, so long as scientific progress takes away diphtheria, tuberculosis, and other diseases, a consummation devoutly to be wished, without helping people to get over their anxiety, guilt, emptiness, and purposelessness, sickness is only forced into a new channel. That may sound like a rash statement, but in principle, I believe it is true. The struggle against disease in the compartmentalized way is like Hercules's battle against the seven-headed hydra. Every time he cut off one head, another grew in its place. The battle for health must be won on the deeper level of the integration of the self. Certainly, it is no depreciation of the great value of the new medical discoveries to emphasize that we shall make lasting progress in health only to the extent that we go beyond finding means of killing germs and bacilli and external organisms which invade the body and discover means of helping ourselves and other people so to affirm their own beings that they will not need to be sick. Awareness of one's feelings lays the groundwork for the second step, knowing what one wants. This point may look very simple at first glance. Who does not know what he wants? But as we pointed out in the first chapter, the amazing thing is how few people actually do. If one looks honestly into himself, does he not find that most of what he thinks he wants is just routine, like fish on Friday, or that what he wants is what he thinks he should want, like being a success in his work, or wants to want, like loving his neighbor? 
one can often see clearly the expression of direct and honest wants in children before they have been taught to falsify their desires. The child exclaims, I like ice cream, I want a cone, and there is no confusion about who wants what. Such directness of desire often comes like a breath of fresh air in a murky land. It may not be best that he have the cone at the time, and it is obviously the parent's responsibility to say yes or no if the child is not mature enough to decide. But let the parents not teach the child to falsify his emotions by trying to persuade him that he does not want the cone. To be aware of one's feelings and desires does not at all imply expressing them indiscriminately wherever one happens to be. Judgment and decision, as we shall see later, are part of any mature consciousness of self. But how is one going to have a basis for judging what he will or will not do unless he first knows what he wants? For an adolescent to be aware that he has erotic impulses toward some person of the opposite sex sitting across from him in the streetcar or towards his mother does not at all mean that he acts on these impulses. But suppose he never lets these impulses reach the threshold of awareness because they are not socially acceptable. How is he then to know years later when he is married whether he engages in sexual relations with his wife because he really wants to, or whether because this is then the acceptable and expected act, the routine thing to do? People who voice with alarm the caution that, unless desires and emotions are suppressed, they will pop out every which way, and everyone, for example, will be overcome by sexual desire for his mother or his best friend's wife, are talking about neurotic emotions. As a matter of fact, we know that it is precisely the emotions and desires which have been repressed which later return to drive the person compulsively— the Victorian gyroscope kind of man had to control his emotions rigidly, for by virtue of having locked them up in jail, he had turned them into lawbreakers. But the more integrated a person is, the less compulsive become his emotions. In the mature person, feelings and wants occur in a configuration. In seeing a dinner as part of a drama on the stage, to give a simple example— one is not consumed with desire for food. One came to see a drama and not to eat. Or, when listening to a concert singer, one is not consumed with sexual desire, even though she may be very attractive. The configuration is set by the fact that one chose in coming to hear music. Of course, as we have indicated throughout this book, none of us escape conflicts from time to time. But these are different from being compulsively driven by emotions. Every direct and immediate experience of feeling and wanting is spontaneous and unique. That is to say, the wanting and feeling are uniquely part of that particular situation at that particular time and place. Spontaneity means to be able to respond directly to the total picture, or, as it is technically called, to respond to the figure-ground configuration. Spontaneity is the active I becoming part of the figure ground. In a good portrait painting, the background is always an integral part of the portrait, so an act of a mature human being is an integral part of the self in relation to the world around it. Spontaneity, thus, is very different from effervescence or egocentricity, or letting out one's feelings regardless of the environment. Spontaneity, rather, is the acting I responding to a particular environment at a given moment. The originality and uniqueness which is always part of a spontaneous feeling can be understood in this light. For just as there never was exactly that situation before and never will be again, so the feeling one has at that time is new and never to be exactly repeated. It is only neurotic behavior which is rigidly repetitive. The third step, along with rediscovering our feelings and wants, is to recover our relation with the subconscious aspects of ourselves. We shall add only some brief comments about this step. As modern man has given up sovereignty over his body, so also has he surrendered the unconscious side of his personality, and it has become almost alien to him. 
In earlier chapters, we have heard how the suppression of the irrational, subjective, and unconscious aspects of experience went hand in hand with modern man's need to emphasize regular, rational work in the world of industry and commerce. Now we need to find and welcome back, so far as we can, what we suppressed. All through the ages, even before the time when Joseph interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh until the modern period, people have regarded their dreams, for example, as sources of wisdom, guidance, and insight. But most of us today think of our dreams as odd episodes, as foreign as some strange ceremonial dance in Tibet. This results in the cutting off of an exceedingly great and significant portion of the self. We are no longer able to use much of the wisdom and power of the unconscious. It puts us in the position of trying to drive a chariot with reins attached to only one horse, in Plato's time-honored figure, with the four or five other horses pulling off in different directions. Though the tendencies and intuitions in the unconscious are blocked off from our conscious awareness, they are still part of the self and accessible in various degrees to being made conscious. The sooner we recover sovereignty in that portion of the kingdom, the better. To go into dream interpretation in any detail would take us too far afield from our topic in this chapter. Understanding dreams is of course a subtle and complex matter, though it is not so complex as one would think when he reads about the esoteric symbols in much modern dream interpretation. These esoteric symbols put the whole problem back into a foreign language again, and that is another way, perhaps the typically modern way, of surrendering our sovereignty over the unconscious aspects of ourselves, as though we were saying, the authorities and those who know the magic answers can understand our dreams, but we cannot ourselves. Dr. Eric Fromm's recent book, The Forgotten Language, points out that dreams like myths and fairy tales are not at all a foreign language, but are in reality part of the one universal language shared by all mankind. Fromm's book is to be recommended to the non-technical reader who wishes to relearn something about this subconscious language of his fatherland. In this chapter, we wish only to bespeak a sympathetic attitude toward dreams and other expressions of the subconscious and unconscious aspects of ourselves. Dreams are expressions not only of conflicts and repressed desires, but also of previous knowledge that one has learned, possibly many years before, and thinks he has forgotten. Even the unskilled person, if he takes the attitude that what his dreams tell him is not simply to be rejected as silly, may get occasional useful guidance from his dreams. And the person who has become skillful in the understanding of what he is saying to himself in his dreams can get from them, from time to time, marvelously valuable hints and insights into solutions to his problems. The upshot of this chapter has been to show that the more self-awareness a person has, the more alive he is, the more consciousness, remarked Kierkegaard, the more self. Becoming a person means this heightened awareness, this heightened experience of I-ness, this experience that is I, the acting one, who is the subject of what is occurring. This view of what it means to become a person, in conclusion, saves us from two errors. The first is passivism, letting the deterministic forces in one's experience take the place of self-awareness. I use this word for the unconstructive neurotic form of passivity. Some forms of passivity, such as reverie and relaxation, may be normal and constructive, but in those forms the self is still in the center of awareness. It is I who am relaxing or in reverie. It must be admitted that some tendencies in the older forms of psychoanalysis can be used to rationalize passivism. It was the epic-making discovery of Freud to show how much every person is pushed by unconscious fears, desires, and tendencies of all sorts, and that man is really much less a master in the household of his own mind than the nineteenth-century man of willpower fondly believed. But a harmful implication was carried along with this emphasis on the determinism of unconscious forces, which Freud himself partly succumbed to. 
The early psychotherapist Grodek, for example, wrote, We are lived by our unconscious, and Freud in a letter commended him for his emphasis on the passivity of the ego. But we must underline to correct a partial misunderstanding that the overall purpose of Freud's exploration of the unconscious forces was to help people bring these forces into consciousness. The goal of psychoanalysis, as he said time and again, was to make the unconscious conscious, to enlarge the scope of awareness, to help the individual become aware of the unconscious tendencies which have tended to push the self around like mutinous sailors who have seized power below the deck of the ship, and thus to help the person consciously direct his own ship. Hence the emphasis in this chapter on the heightened awareness of oneself and the warning against passivism have much in common with the overall purpose of Freud's thought. The other error this view of the person enables us to avoid is activism, that is, using activity as a substitute for awareness. By activism we mean the tendency so common in this country to assume that the more one is acting, the more one is alive. It should be clear that when we have used the term the active I in this book, we have not meant busyness or merely doing things. Many people keep busy all the time as a way of covering up anxiety. Their activism is a way of running from themselves. They get a pseudo and temporary sense of aliveness by being in a hurry, as though something is going on if they are but moving, and as though being busy is a proof of one's importance. Chaucer has a sly and astute comment about this type represented in The Merchant in Canterbury Tales. Methinks he seemed busier than he was. Our emphasis on self-awareness certainly includes acting as an expression of the alive integrated self, but it is the opposite to activism, the opposite, that is, to acting as an escape from self-awareness. Aliveness often means the capacity not to act, to be creatively idle, which may be more difficult for most modern people than to do something. To be idle, Robert Louis Stevenson accurately wrote, requires a strong sense of personal identity. Self-awareness, as we have proposed it, brings back into the picture the quieter kinds of aliveness, the arts of contemplation and meditation, for example, which the Western world to its peril has all but lost. It brings a new appreciation for being something, rather than merely doing something. With such a relation to oneself, work for us modern men who are the great toilers and producers will not be an escape from ourselves or a way of trying to prove our worth, but a creative expression of the spontaneous powers of the person who has consciously affirmed his relatedness to his world and his fellow men. 4. The Struggle to Be but is not the path to self-awareness fraught with more vicissitudes, more peaks and precipices of difficulty and conflict than implied in the foregoing chapter? True, and we now turn to the more dynamic aspects of becoming a person. For most people, particularly adults trying to overcome the earlier experiences which have blocked them in becoming persons in their own right, achieving consciousness of self involves struggle and conflict. They find that becoming persons requires not only learning to feel, to experience, and to want, as we pointed out in the preceding chapter, but to fight against what prevents them from feeling and wanting. They discover that there are certain chains which hold them back. These chains, in essence, are the ties which bind them to the parents, especially in our society, to the mother. We have heard that the human being's development is a continuum of differentiation from the mass toward freedom as an individual. We have also noted that the potential person is originally a unity with the mother as a fetus in the womb, where it is fed automatically through the umbilical cord without any choice by mother or baby. When it is born and the physical umbilical cord is cut, it has become a physical individual, and feeding thereafter involves some conscious choice 
on the part of both parties. The infant can raise a howl in demand for food, and the mother can say yes or no. But the infant still is almost completely dependent on the parents, particularly the mother who nurses him. His becoming an individual continues through an infinite number of steps. The emergence of consciousness of self with the rudimentary beginnings of responsibility and freedom, the movement out from the parental yard when he goes to school, the maturation into a sexual individual at puberty, the struggles of going out on his own to college and in making vocational choices, the assuming of responsibility for a new family in marriage, and so on. All through life, a person is engaged in this continuum of differentiation of himself from the whole, followed by steps toward new integration. Indeed, all evolution can be described as the process of differentiation of the part from the whole, the individual from the mass, with the parts then relating to each other on a higher level. Since the human being, in contrast to a stone or chemical compound, can fulfill his individuality only by conscious and responsible choice, he must become a psychological and ethical as well as a physical individual. Strictly speaking, the process of being born from the womb, cutting free from the mass, replacing dependency with choice, is involved in every decision of one's life and even is the issue facing one on his deathbed. For what is the capacity to die courageously except the ultimate step in the continuum of learning to be on one's own, to leave the whole? Thus every person's life could be portrayed by a graph of differentiation. How far has he freed himself from automatic dependencies, become an individual, able then to relate to his fellows on the new level of self-chosen love, responsibility, and creative work. We now turn to the psychological struggles involved in this differentiation of the person from the mass. Cutting the Psychological Umbilical Cord The baby becomes a physical individual when the umbilical cord is severed at his birth, but unless the psychological umbilical cord is also in due time cut, he remains like a toddler tied to a stake in his parents' front yard. He can go no farther than the length of his rope. His development is blocked, and the surrendered freedom for growth turns inward and festers in resentment and anger. These are the people who, though they may seem to get along tolerably well within the range of the toddler's rope, are greatly upset when they confront marriage, or when they go off to work, or eventually face death. In every crisis they tend figuratively or literally to go back to mother. As one young husband put it, I cannot love my wife enough because I love my mother too much. His only error was in using the word love for his relation to his mother. Real love is expansive and never excludes loving others. It is only being tied to the mother which is exclusive and blocks one's loving one's wife. In our time, the tendency to remain enchained is particularly strong, since when a society is so disrupted that it is no longer a mother in the sense of giving the individual minimal consistent support, he tends to cling much more closely to the physical mother of his childhood. An actual case may help us see more concretely what these ties are like and the difficulties involved in cutting them. The following case is not extraordinary. Indeed, almost the only unusual aspect of it is that the mother's behavior was not so subtle or disguised as in many cases. A gifted man of thirty was troubled with homosexual feelings, lack of any positive feelings towards women, but very great fears of them at the same time. He avoided intimacy with anyone, and also he was blocked in his completion of his doctoral dissertation for his graduate degree. An only child, he had developed a contempt for his father, who was weak and under the mother's domination. The mother had often belittled the father in the boy's presence. He once overheard her saying to the father in an argument, "'You are worth more to us dead than alive, but you have always been a coward and you are afraid to take your own life.' The boy had been dressed carefully by his mother when he went to school, was not able to fight, 
and his mother would come to school when necessary to protect him from the rougher boys. She would intimately confide in the boy at length, telling him how much she suffered with the father and required him to help her with some toilet functions, a practice he greatly disliked. Even in college days when he returned for vacation, he would be paralyzed with anxiety when hearing his mother coming up the stairs at night for fear she would come into his room when he was undressed. She had carried on an extramarital affair rather openly when he was a boy, which upset him greatly, and, as often happens in such situations, it made him much more jealous of her attentions. Later on in adolescence, she tried to block his meeting girls, but when he dated anyway, she endeavored to make dates for him with girls whose families could enhance her social position. When he was a boy, much was made of his piano playing and recitations in school and Sunday school. One time he greatly embarrassed his parents at Sunday school exercises by being unable to recite the commandment, Honor thy mother and father, and when his mother would have him play the piano at ladies' meetings, he would forget the piece no matter how well he had known it beforehand. He was a very bright boy and had many successes in school and later gained some prestige in the armed forces but these were treated by his mother as ways of enhancing her own prestige in the community. The listener has no doubt already noticed that his blockage in completing his doctoral work had much in common with his forgetting the piano solo. Both were rebellions against his mother's exploitation of his successes. For one way to defend yourself against someone's exploiting your successes is to accomplish nothing which the other could take away. The mother's frequent letters to him at the time of his therapy were long complaints and descriptions of her minor heart attacks, together with outright requests that he come home and take responsibility for her, and hints that she would have another attack if he didn't show more interest. The problems of this young man, which we have described in a somewhat oversimplified way, are in several ways typical of many young men in our society. First, he suffered from lack of feeling, confusion of sexual role, and a lack of potency, both sexually and in his work. A second relatively typical aspect is the family pattern. It will be noted that this family is significantly different from the patriarchal families which Freud had in mind when he first formulated his Oedipus doctrine. In our young man's family, the mother was the dominating figure— the father was weak and pictured as somewhat contemptible to the son. The third aspect is that the boy had been favored by the mother, made prince consort, and placed in the father's position. This preferential treatment to continue so long as the boy pleased the mother. But uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. The young man derived no real sense of security and power from his position on the throne, for he was there not because of his own strength— but as a puppet of the mother. The classical Oedipus picture is present in this case to be sure, but with important differences. The boy is deathly afraid of castration, losing his power, but it is the mother who castrates him, not the father. The father is not much of a rival, the mother has seen to that. The son has had no figure of masculine strength to identify with, so he lacks that normal source of the experience of power for a growing boy. As a substitute for this lack of power, he has only his mother's adulation, pampering and domineering attention. As would be expected, such a young man had frequent dreams of being literally a prince. His narcissism was very great, for it had to compensate for his actual inner feeling that he was almost completely powerless. He could rebel a little against his mother by not accomplishing things, and by occasional verbal spats, but this was only the passive protest of a slave toward its master. It is not in the slightest surprising that this man should be deathly afraid of women, nor is it surprising that he should be in so much inward conflict that he would be unable to move ahead in work, love, or any intimacy with persons. What is the way out of such a morbid intertwining? Of course, a child can temporarily withdraw, seeking to protect himself from exploitation by making himself as little as possible, and thus try to avoid the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. 
one young man looking back on a boyhood in which he was caught in the crossfire between a weak alcoholic father and a dominating martyr-type mother, described in a poem how he saw himself in those early years. You stand there by the table, still clutching your teddy bear. Make it so small they'll fail to find it. Then you're left alone to defend what they didn't want, not being able to find it. Or, and this generally occurs later, he can try to take arms against a sea of troubles and struggle actively to achieve his freedom as a person in his own right. To this we now turn. The Struggle Against Mother The struggle for such freedom is presented in one of the greatest dramas of all times, that of Orestes. Let us look at the problem through the insights of that drama. This will help not only because a historical perspective gives us new light on the present, but also because the profoundest truths of human experience, like those in the drama of Oedipus or the Book of Job, can be seen most clearly in the classical forms which have endured age after age. This great story of human conflict was written first by Aeschylus in ancient Greece, and recently has been retold in modern verse by Robinson Jeffers in The Tower Beyond Tragedy. While Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, is off leading the Greek armies in the war against Troy, his wife, Clytemnestra, takes her uncle Aegisthus as her lover. When Agamemnon returns from Troy, she murders him. She then exiles her infant son Orestes from the kingdom and keeps her daughter Electra in a servile position. When Orestes comes of age, he returns to Mycenae to kill his mother. Facing him with his drawn sword in front of the palace, Clytemnestra tries to get his pity by blaming his father. Hard was my lot, my child. And then she resorts to threats, crying, My curse beware, the mother's curse that bore thee. And when these strategies do not work, as Robinson Jeffers pictures it, she finally tries to seduce Orestes, with false protestations of her love, embracing him and kissing him passionately. He suddenly goes limp, drops his sword with the words, I will be passive, I am blunted. The amazing thing about this sudden inert passivity is that it is so vividly what every psychotherapist today observes in the cases of many young men, and acting out of the loss of potency in their struggle with a dominating mother. It is only when Orestes notes that the mother quickly takes advantage of his moment of passivity to summon her soldiers, and realizes that her so-called love is not love at all, but a strategy for getting him under her power, that he arises, regains his strength, and strikes the blow. Then Orestes, in effect, goes mad. He is pursued by the Furies, the punishing spirits of the night, with their locks entwined with knotted snakes. These are the Greek mythological figures impersonating self-reproach and a bad conscience, and again it is astonishing how keenly and accurately the ancient Greeks described these symbols of the gnawing guilt which will not let a person sleep, and may push him into neurosis or even psychosis. Orestes is driven, sleepless and weary, by the Furies, until finally he falls with his arms around Apollo's altar at Delphi, where temporarily he receives a respite. Then, under Apollo's protection, he is sent to Athens, where he is tried before a large court presided over by Athena. The tremendous issue to be decided is whether a person is to be judged guilty for killing a dominating and exploitative parent. Since the outcome will in actuality be crucial for the future of mankind, the gods from Olympus come down to participate in the debate. After many speeches, Athena makes the charge to the jury in which she adjures them not to cast from your walls all high authority, to preserve reverence of the gods and holy fear, and to avoid the twin perils of anarchy on one hand and slavish masterdom on the other. The jury votes, and it is a tie. So Athena herself, the goddess of civic virtues, objectivity, and wisdom, has to cast the deciding vote. She announces to the court that if mankind is to advance, persons must become free from the chains to such hating parents, even though it involves killing the parent. 
and so by her vote Orestes is forgiven. Underneath this bare outline lies a terrifying struggle of human passions, a conflict as profound and basic as any in human experience. The theme is the killing of the mother, but the meaning really is the struggle of Orestes, the son, for his existence as a person. It is nothing less than the struggle to be or not to be a psychological and spiritual being. As Athena and others make clear in the speeches at the trial, it is a debate between the old ways, customs, and morals represented by the spirit of Clytemnestra and the Erenes, the sisters from the dark underground, and the new, advocated by Apollo and Athena, and personified by Orestes's act. The stories can, of course, be interpreted sociologically as the struggle of the new patriarchy against the old matriarchy, as Eric Fromm does in his book The Forgotten Language. We are concerned here, however, with the psychological implications of the conflict. With a fascinating psychological acumen, Aeschylus points out that Orestes could not choose but scale the height, and that he would have been sick forever if he had not done the deed. And in the concluding crescendo, Aeschylus has the Greek chorus sing, The light has come, the day dawns clear. That is to say, with Orestes's deed, new light and clarification came into the world. To many people, the most shocking thing about this drama when we relate it to the problems of today will not be what it says about Orestes, but in its implication that some mothers are like Clytemnestra. To be sure, Clytemnestra is an extreme figure. No human being's motives are really unmixed hate or love or desire for power, but rather are complex blendings of these motives. It is true that Clytemnestra is a symbol more than a person, a symbol for the dominating and authoritarian tendencies in the parent which would exile and strangle the potentialities of the child. And it is true also that this drama with the usual profoundness and courage of the Greek literature minces no words in presenting these basic human conflicts. Most of us in the modern day fed a more superficial diet, find this medicine too strong for our taste. What does the killing of the parent mean? The essence of the struggle is that the growing person, in this case Orestes, fights against the authoritarian powers which would strangle his growth and freedom. Such powers in the family circle may head up more in the father or in the mother— Freud indeed believed it more or less universally true that the conflict would be between father and son, that the father would try to exile, to take away the power of, to castrate the son, and that the son, like Oedipus, would have to kill his father to gain his own right to exist. We now know, however, that the Oedipus complex is not universal, but depends on cultural and historical factors. Freud grew up in the society of the German father. There is much evidence in our middle of the twentieth century in this country that the mother, not the father, has been the dominant figure in the families of persons who are now, let us say, between twenty and fifty, that the relation to her presents the greatest problem, and that the Orestes myth is the one which they feel expresses most profoundly their own experience. I speak not only on the basis of the deeper feelings and dreams of people with whom I have worked professionally in psychotherapy, but also out of the experience of other therapists with whom I have talked. As in the case we described earlier, the son is often enchained to the mother in the respect that he learns to get his rewards only by pleasing her. It is as though the son's potency is accessible to him only for the purpose of living up to the high expectations of his mother. And, of course, potency is not power at all when it is available only at someone else's command. Thus, obviously, he is not able to use his power for the development of himself as a person or in loving other people until he becomes free from his ties to her. As we describe the conflict with dominating mothers, some listeners may be reminded of the arguments about momism, which have recently been current. How much truth there is in the charges of momism, I don't pretend to know. 
My guess, however, is that a good deal of the generation of vipers type of writing is a way of getting out vituperation against the mother when the real thing underneath that makes one so angry is one's own dependence on her. However that may be, there is still plenty of evidence that the system in our country is beginning to resemble a matriarchy, as the psychiatrist Edward A. Strecker points out. The psychoanalyst Eric Erickson discussing in Childhood and Society the origins of this matriarchal development feels that mom is more the victim than the victor, and that the American mother was forced into the position of power because the father, at work in the city five days a week and around the house only on weekends, abdicated the central position in the family. Mother became mom only when father became pop. Matriarchy is one thing, but we still have the question of why there is such a demanding quality in the power the women exert in our latter-day matriarchy. We should emphasize, by the way, that we are not talking about the present generation of mothers. They are in general confused. It is particularly out of the previous generation of mothers that these problems arose in our society. I do not know the psychosociological causes of the situation. All we can do is note that the mothers of these patients in psychotherapy, like the castrating mother of the young man in the case cited before, behave as though they had suffered some great disappointment. Clytemnestra said that she did what she did from an age-old hate. Certainly no one like Clytemnestra endeavors to exercise such exploitative and demanding power unless there is good reason for it. Generally, the reason is that she has been greatly hurt herself and feels that the only way to protect herself from future suffering is to dominate others. Is it that women of that previous generation in our society were given some tremendous expectations of what they would receive from men? Was it a result of the frontier psychology in which women had a special value, merging with attitudes of the late Victorian period when women were placed on a pedestal? Were these women then given the expectation that they would be forever served? And in the process was their function as women radically frustrated in some way. Actually, we know that this late Victorian generation of women was a very frustrated group sexually, and very possibly in other ways as well. For how could women simply enjoy and have gratification being women when they were worshipped on pedestals on the frontier and expected to civilize the frontier at the same time? is the answer to our question that this generation of mothers, having been led to expect wonderful things from men, were deeply disappointed in their husbands, and take out this disappointment in excessive possessiveness and domination of the son. Probably all of these points have something to do with the mother-child tie in our particular society. But the Greeks, not content to present these questions sociologically and psychologically, proceed to shake the foundations of our discussion by suggesting, naively enough, that there may be some biological tie between mother and child which makes the child's becoming free from the mother so crucial and difficult. The question is raised in the drama in the fact that the goddess who casts the vote which forgives Orestes is Athena, the goddess who, as she puts it, never knew the mother's womb that bore me, but sprang full attired from the forehead of her father, Zeus. This is a startling idea to meditate on. The birth without benefit of womb is amazing enough to begin with, but it becomes even staggering when we consider the implications of the fact that the Greeks made this Athena the goddess of wisdom. She says she votes for Orestes because she, never having existed in the womb, is on the side of the new. Does this imply that the human being's pilgrimage from dependence, prejudice, and immaturity toward independence, wisdom, and maturity is so difficult at best, so hobbled by ties to physical and psychological umbilical cords, that the mythological goddess of wisdom and civic virtue must be pictured as one who never had to fight against the umbilical cord? We know that the infant is closer to the mother in whose womb he gestates and from whose breast he is fed 
than to the father. Are the Greeks implying that since the child is blood of the mother's blood and flesh of her flesh, he will always be bound by his tie to her, and that the mother relationship will always tend to be conserving rather than revolutionary, oriented to the past more than to the future? The Greeks knew better than to imply that wisdom exists in a vacuum of unrelatedness, or that there is anything wrong in ties as such, but they may mean that the temptation to be sheltered, to regress, to be passive and blunted, as Orestes puts it, are symbolized by the tendency to go back into the womb, and that maturity and freedom as an individual are the opposite to these tendencies. Is this the reason their goddess of wisdom never knew the womb? We shall leave these questions for the listeners to answer as he sees fit and return to Orestes. For our real interest here is in how this young man, as the prototype of the person in emotional conflict, achieves his freedom to live as a person. In his temporary madness after performing the deed, Orestes wanders through the forest sick with visions. Robinson Jeffers, in his version, pictures Orestes then coming back to the palace at Mycenae, where his sister Electra invites him to become king in his father's place. Orestes looks at her in amazement and asks how she can be so unperceptive as to think he went through the terrible deed of killing his mother just to be king of Mycenae in Agamemnon's place. No, he has outgrown the city and has resolved to leave. Electra, assuming that his trouble is that he needs a woman, proposes to marry him. He then exclaims, It is Clytemnestra in you and he points out that the whole trouble in their unfortunate family has been incest. In his struggles in the forest, he continues, I saw a vision of us move in the dark. All that we did or dreamed of regarded each other. The man pursued the woman. The woman clung to the man. Warriors and kings strained at each other in the darkness. All loved or fought inward. Each one of the lost people sought the eyes of another, that another should praise him— sought never his own, but another's. When they look backward, they see only a man standing at the beginning, or forward, a man at the end, or if upward, men in the shining bitter sky striding and feasting, whom you call gods. It is all turned inward, all your desires incestuous. For himself, Orestes has resolved that he will not waste inward. If he should accede to her pleading and remain in Mycenae, he tells his sister, he would be like a stone walking. That is to say, he would have forfeited his unique nature as a human being and would have become inorganic. As he walks out toward humanity and away from the incestuous nest of Mycenae, he concludes with a phrase which could ring down the corridors of centuries as the goal of man's psychological integration. I have fallen in love outward. It is by no accident that Orestes uses the terms inward and outward several times in these few lines, and that he says the main trouble in Mycenae has been incest, for incest is simply the sexual physical symbol of being turned inward on the family, and of being unable correspondingly to love outwardly. Psychologically, incestuous desires, when they continue past adolescence, are the sexual symptom of morbid dependency on the parent, and they occur predominantly in persons who have not grown up, have not cut the psychological umbilical cord which binds them to the parent. Sexual gratification is then not too different from the oral gratification the child receives in being fed by the mother. Prominent also in incestuous relations is, as Orestes says, the need to be admired by the other, that another should praise him. With the special acumen of poetry, Jeffers has Orestes say that even the religion of these people is incestuous. They see only projections of themselves in the sky, men striding and feasting whom they call gods. Their gods are expressions not of new and higher levels of aspiration and integration, but of their own need to turn back to infantile dependencies. Religiously and psychologically, this is, of course, the exact opposite to what Jesus proclaims. 
I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Obviously Jesus is not preaching hatred and division as such, but he means to state in the most radical form that spiritual development is away from incest and toward the capacity to love the neighbor and stranger. The members of a man's own household will be his foes in truth if he is still bound to them. The taboo against incest found in almost every society has sound psychosocial merit in that it makes for the introduction of new blood and new genes, or, more accurately, the enlarging of the possibilities of change and development. Incest does not do physical harm to the baby. It merely doubles the same heredity in the child and robs it of the possibilities it would have if the parent had married outside the family. That is to say, the prohibition against incest makes for greater differentiation in human development and requires that integration be found not through sameness, but on a higher level. Thus we can add to our statement at the beginning of this chapter that the continuum of differentiation which is the life pilgrimage of the human being requires developing away from incest and toward the capacity to love outwardly. The Struggle Against One's Own Dependency Obviously, the moral of the Orestes drama is not that everyone get a gun and kill his mother. What has to be killed, as we have already implied, is the infantile ties of dependency which binds the person to the parents, and thereby keeps him from loving outwardly and creating independently. This is no simple job to be initiated by a sudden resolution and performed in one great burst of freedom, nor is it accomplished by one big blow-up against one's parents. The Orestes drama, as dramas do, condenses the struggle to be into a few weeks. Actually, in real life, it is a matter of long uphill growth to new levels of integration. Growth meaning not automatic process, but re-education, finding new insights, making self-conscious decisions, and throughout being willing to face occasional or frequent bitter struggles. A person in psychotherapy often must work through his patterns for months to discover how much he has been tied without knowing it, and to see time and again that this enchantment underlies his inability to love, to work, or to marry. He then finds that the struggle to become a person in his own right often brings considerable anxiety and, occasionally, some actual terror. It is not surprising that those who are fighting to break such chains go through terrific emotional upsets and conflicts, comparable to Orestes's temporary madness. The conflict is, in essence, that of moving out from a protected, familiar place into new independence, from support to temporary isolation, while at the same time one feels one's own anxiety and powerlessness. The struggle takes a severe, that is, neurotic, form when the individual has been unable to grow at previous stages in his development. Thus, neurotic conflicts have grown and the eventual break is more traumatic and radical. The conflict between Orestes and his mother had to occur in that traumatic way because of the previous hatreds, incestuous relations, and morbidity in the interpersonal relations in Mycenae. What keeps the person tied to the parent? Aeschylus, typically Greek, portrays the source of the problem as objective. Certain evil things have gone on for several generations in the royal family at Mycenae, and Orestes therefore could do nothing except choose to kill his mother. Shakespeare, typically modern, presents Hamlet's similar struggle to be as an internal subjective conflict with his own conscience, guilt, ambivalent courage, and indecisiveness. The truth is that Aeschylus and Shakespeare are both right. Such struggles are both inward and outward. 
The authoritarian shackling which the person endures earliest in life is external. The growing infant, whether a child of exploitative parents or, let us say, a Jew born in a country with anti-Semitic prejudice, is the victim of the external circumstances. The child must face and adjust to, by hook or crook, the world he is born into. But gradually, in anyone's development, the authoritarian problem becomes internalized. The growing person takes over the rules and plants them in himself, and he tends to act all his life as though he still were fighting the original forces which would enslave him. But it now has become an internal conflict. Fortunately, there is a happy moral in this point, since the person has taken over the suppressive forces and keeps them going in himself, he also has in himself the power to get over them. For adults, then, who are engaged in rediscovering themselves, the battle is centrally an internal one. The struggle to become a person takes place within the person himself. None of us can avoid taking a stand against exploitative persons or external forces in the environment, to be sure, but the crucial psychological battle we must wage is that against our own dependent needs and our anxiety and guilt feelings which will arise as we move toward freedom. The basic conflict, in fine, is between that part of the person which seeks growth, expansion, and health against the part which longs to remain on an immature level, tied still to the psychological umbilical cord, and receiving the pseudo-protection and pampering of the parent in exchange for independence. STAGES IN CONSCIOUSNESS OF SELF We have heard that becoming a person means going through several stages of consciousness of one's self. The first is that of the innocence of the infant before consciousness of self is born. The second is the stage of rebellion, when the person is trying to become free to establish some inner strength in his own right. This stage is most clearly seen in the child of two or three or the adolescent, and may involve defiance and hostility as shown in extreme form in Orestes's fight for his freedom. In greater or lesser degree, rebellion is a necessary transition as one cuts old ties and seeks to make new ones. But rebellion is not to be confused with freedom. The third stage we may call the ordinary consciousness of self. In this stage, a person can, to some extent, see his errors, make some allowance for his prejudices, use his guilt feelings and anxiety as experiences to learn from, and make his decisions with some responsibility. This is what most people mean when they speak of a healthy state of personality. But there is a fourth stage of consciousness which is extraordinary in the sense that most individuals experience it only rarely. This stage is most clearly illustrated when one gets a sudden insight into a problem. Abruptly, seemingly from nowhere, pops up an answer for which one has struggled in vain for days. Sometimes such insights come in dreams or at moments of reverie when one is thinking about something else. In any case, we know that the answer emerges from what are called subconscious levels in the personality. Such consciousness may occur in scientific, religious, or artistic activity alike. It is sometimes popularly called dawning of ideas or inspiration. As all students of creative activity make clear, this level of consciousness is present in all creative work. What shall this level be called? Objective self-consciousness, as it would be termed in some oriental thinking because of the glimpses it affords into objective truth? or self-surpassing consciousness, as Nietzsche might call it, or self-transcending consciousness in the ethical religious tradition. All these terms distort as well as clarify. I propose a term which is less dramatic, but perhaps for our day, more satisfactory. Creative consciousness of self. The classical psychological term for this awareness is ecstasy. The word literally means to stand outside oneself, that is, to catch a view of or experience something from a perspective outside one's usual limited viewpoint. 
ordinarily what a person sees in the objective world around him is always more or less distorted and clouded by the fact that he sees it subjectively. As human beings, what we see is always through personal eyes and interpreted by each person through his own private world. We are always dogged, that is, by a dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity. This fourth level of consciousness cuts below the split between objectivity and subjectivity. Temporarily, we can transcend the usual limits of conscious personality. Through what is called insight or intuition or the other only vaguely understood processes which are involved in creativity, we may get glimpses of objective truth as it exists in reality, or sense some new ethical possibility in, let us say, an experience of unselfish love. This is what Orestes experienced in his thoughts while wandering in the forest after the deed. They have not made words for it, to go behind things, beyond hours and ages, and be all things in all time. How can I express the excellence I have found that has no color but clearness, no honey but ecstasy, no desire but fulfilled, no passion but peace? Lest the point be obscured for some listeners by Jeffers's poetic language, let us emphasize that what Orestes means can be described fairly well in psychological terms. It is simply a further stage of the fact that he has been able to overcome the tendency of the men in Mycenae to see only themselves in other people's eyes, all turned inward, all preoccupied with the projections of their own prejudices, which they in their conceit name truth. To be rather turned outward means to pierce in imagination beyond what one knows at the moment— it is not unscientific sentimentality to point out, as Nietzsche and almost every other writer on ethics has done, that man, in fulfilling himself, goes through a process of transcending himself. This is simply one side of the basic characteristics of the growing, healthy human being, that from moment to moment he is enlarging his awareness of himself and his world. Life is occupied in both perpetuating itself and in surpassing itself, Simone de Beauvoir points out in her book on ethics. If all it does is maintain itself, then living is only not dying, and human existence is indistinguishable from an absurd vegetation. This creative self-consciousness is a stage that most of us achieve only at rare intervals, and none of us except the saints, religious or secular, and the great creative figures live very much of our lives on this level. But it is the level which gives meaning to our actions and experiences on the lesser levels. Many people may have experienced this consciousness in some special moment, let us say, in listening to music or in some new experience of love or friendship which temporarily takes them out of the usual walled-in routine of their lives. It is as though for a moment one stood on a mountain peak and viewed his life from that wide and unlimited perspective. One gets his sense of direction from his view from the peak and sketches a mental map which guides him for weeks of patient plodding up and down the lesser hills when effort is dull and inspiration is conspicuous by its absence. For the fact that at some instant we have been able to see truth unclouded by our own prejudices, to love other persons without demand for ourselves, and to create in the ecstasy that occurs when we are totally absorbed in what we are doing, the fact that we have had these glimpses gives a basis of meaning and direction for all of our later actions. This fourth level is what is meant in such statements as those in the Bible about losing one's life for the sake of the values one believes in. Thus it is true that there is a kind of self-forgetting on this level of consciousness. But the word self-forgetting is a poor term. This consciousness in another sense is the most fulfilled state of human existence. One cannot demand the awareness we are discussing, and, as we have said, it often occurs in moments of receptivity and relaxation rather than action. 
Nonetheless, the evidence in studies of creative people is that they get their important insights on those particular problems on which they have wrestled with perseverance and diligence, even though the insight itself may come at a moment of lull. One cannot command one's dreams, for example, but one gets fruitful insights from them to the extent that he is actively concerned with doing so, and can train himself to be vigilant in his sensitivity to his dreams. Nietzsche described the person who has creative self-consciousness when he said about Goethe, He disciplined himself into wholeness. He created himself. Such a spirit who has become free stands amid the cosmos with a joyous and trusting fatalism in the faith that, in the whole, all is redeemed and affirmed, and he does not negate any more. Part 3. The Goals of Integration 5. Freedom and Inner Strength what would happen to a person if his freedom were entirely and literally taken away? We shall approach that question by constructing in fantasy an imaginative parable. This parable might be called The Man Who Was Put in a Cage. One evening a king of a far-off land was standing at his window, vaguely listening to some music drifting down the corridor from the reception room in the other wing of the palace. The king was wearied from the diplomatic reception he had just attended, and he looked out of the window pondering about the ways of the world in general, and nothing in particular. His eye fell upon a man in the square below, apparently an average man, walking to the corner to take the tram home, who had taken that same route five nights a week for many years. The king followed this man in his imagination, pictured him arriving home, perfunctorily kissing his wife, eating his late meal, inquiring whether everything was right with the children, reading the paper, going to bed, perhaps engaging in the love act with his wife, or perhaps not, sleeping and getting up and going off to work again the next day. And a sudden curiosity seized the king, which for a moment banished his fatigue. I wonder what would happen if a man were kept in a cage, like the animals at the zoo. So the next day the king called in a psychologist, told him of his idea, and invited him to observe the experiment. Then the king caused a cage to be brought from the zoo, and the average man was brought and placed therein. At first the man was simply bewildered, and he kept saying to the psychologist who stood outside the cage, I have to catch the tram, I have to get to work, look what time it is, I'll be late for work. But later on in the afternoon the man began soberly to realize what was up, and then he protested vehemently, The king can't do this to me. It is unjust and against the laws. His voice was strong and his eyes full of anger. During the rest of the week the man continued his vehement protests. When the king would walk by the cage, as he did every day, the man made his protests directly to the monarch. But the king would answer, Look here, you get plenty of food, you have a good bed, and you don't have to work. We take good care of you, so why are you objecting? Then, after some days, the man's protests lessened, and then ceased. He was silent in his cage, refusing generally to talk, but the psychologist could see hatred glowing like deep fire in his eyes. But after several weeks, the psychologist noticed that more and more it now seemed as if the man were pausing a moment after the king's daily reminder to him that he was being taken good care of. For a second, the hatred was postponed from returning to his eyes, as though he were asking himself if what the king said were possibly true. And after a few weeks more, the man began to discuss with the psychologist how it was a useful thing if man were given food and shelter, and that man had to live by his fate in any case, and the part of wisdom was to accept his fate. So when a group of professors and graduate students came in one day to observe the man in the cage, he was friendly toward them and explained to them that he had chosen this way of life, that there are great values in security and being taken care of, that they would, of course, see how sensible his course was, and so on. How strange, thought the psychologist, and how pathetic. 
Why is it he struggles so hard to get them to approve of his way of life? In the succeeding days when the king would walk through the courtyard, the man would fawn upon him from behind the bars in his cage and thank him for the food and shelter. But when the king was not in the yard and the man was not aware that the psychologist was present, his expression was quite different, sullen and morose. When his food was handed to him through the bars by the keeper, the man would often drop the dishes or dump over the water and then be embarrassed because of his stupidity and clumsiness. His conversation became increasingly one-tracked, and instead of the involved philosophical theories about the value of being taken care of, he had gotten down to simple sentences like, It is fate, which he would say over and over again, or just mumble to himself, It is. It was hard to say just when the last phase set in, but the psychologist became aware that the man's face seemed to have no particular expression. His smile was no longer fawning, but simply empty and meaningless, like the grimace a baby makes when there is gas on its stomach. The man ate his food and exchanged a few sentences with the psychologist from time to time. His eyes were distant and vague, and though he looked at the psychologist, it seemed that he never really saw him. And now the man, in his desultory conversations, never used the word I anymore. He had accepted the cage. He had no anger, no hate, no rationalizations. But he was now insane. That night the psychologist sat in his parlor trying to write a concluding report. But it was very difficult for him to summon up words, for he felt within himself a great emptiness. He kept trying to reassure himself with the words, They say that nothing is ever lost, that matter is merely changed to energy and back again. But he couldn't help feeling something had been lost. Something had been taken out of the universe in this experiment, and there was left only a void. Hatred and Resentment as the Price of Denied Freedom one point in the previous parable which should be especially noted is the hatred which surged up in the man when he realized he was captive. The fact that such a great amount of hatred is generated when people have to give up their freedom proves how essential a value freedom is for them. Often the person in actual life who has had to surrender much of his freedom, usually in his childhood when he could do nothing about it, and to give up some of his right and room to exist as a human being, may seem on the surface to have accepted the situation and adjusted to the surrender. But we do not need to penetrate far under the surface to discover that something else has come in to fill the vacuum, namely hatred and resentment of those who have forced him to give up his freedom. And usually this smoldering hatred is in direct proportion to the degree in which the person's right to exist as a human being has been taken away from him. To be sure, the hatred is repressed, for the slave is not permitted to express hating thoughts toward the masters. But it is there nonetheless, and may come out in the cases of children, for example, in symptoms like the child's failing in school or excessive physical sickness, or bedwetting prolonged beyond the early years, and so on. Indeed, it is not possible for a human being to give up his freedom without something coming in to restore the inner balance, something arising from inner freedom when his outer freedom is denied, and this something is hatred for his conqueror. Hating or resenting is often the person's only way to keep from committing psychological or spiritual suicide. It has the function of preserving some dignity, some feeling of his own identity as though the person, or persons in the case of nations, were to be saying silently to their conquerors, You have conquered me, but I reserve the right to hate you. In cases of severe neurotics or psychotics, it is often exceedingly clear that the person, driven to the wall by earlier unfortunate conditions, has kept in his hatred an inner citadel, a last vestige of dignity and pride. Like the Negro in Faulkner's novel Intruder in the Dust, such contempt for the conquerors keeps the person still an identity in his own right, even though outward conditions deny him the essential rights of the human being. 
In cases in therapy, furthermore, where a person who has been drastically curtailed in the exercise of his power as a human being is unable, after a period of time, to feel or bring out his hatred and resentment, prognosis is less good. Just as the capacity of the little child to stand over against his parents was essential to his being born as a free person, so is the harmed person's capacity eventually to hate or feel anger is a mark of his inner potentialities for standing against his oppressors. Another proof of the fact that if people surrender their freedom they must hate is seen in fact that totalitarian governments must provide for their people some object for the hatred which is generated by the governments having taken away their freedom. The Jews were made the scapegoat in Hitler's Germany along with the enemy nations, and now Stalinism has to turn the hate existing among the Russian people against the warmongering Western countries. As shown so vividly in the novel 1984, if a government sets out to take away people's freedom, it must siphon off their hatred and direct it toward outside groups. Otherwise, the people would revolt or go into a collective psychosis or become psychologically dead and inert, no good as people or as a fighting force. This is one of the most vicious aspects of McCarthyism. It capitalizes on the impotent hatred many people in this country feel toward those who keep us in a stymied position in Korea, namely the Russian communists, and it turns this hatred of citizens toward their fellow citizens. We, of course, do not mean that hatred or resentment in themselves are good things, or that the mark of the healthy person is how much he hates. Nor do we mean that the goal of development is that everyone hates his parents or those in authority. Hatred and resentment are destructive emotions, and the mark of maturity is to transform them into constructive emotions, as we shall hear later. But the fact that the human being will destroy something, generally in the long run himself, rather than surrender his freedom, proves how important freedom is to him. In Kafka's writings, as in much other modern literature, we can see the depressing picture of the modern man who has lost the capacity to stand against his accusers. The chief character in The Trial, K., has been arrested, but he is never informed what he is guilty of. He goes from court to judge to lawyer to court again, mildly complaining and asking that someone explain to him what he is charged with. But he never asserts his rights, never draws a line saying, Beyond this I will not retreat, whether they kill me or not. The priests shouting at him in the church, Don't you understand anything? a scream which lacked middle-class and ecclesiastical good manners but showed the profounder dignity of one person's concern for another person, has in it the meaning, is there no spark left within you? Can you never stand and assert yourself? When the two executioners come for Kay at the end of the novel, they offer him a knife with which to commit suicide. The crowning proof of the tragedy of a man's loss of his last vestige of dignity was that he could not even take his own life. In conventional circles in our day, one is not supposed to admit one's hatred, just as four decades ago sexual impulses were not to be admitted, and two decades ago anger and aggression were considered unseemly in good society. These negative emotions, while they could be overlooked as occasional lapses, did not fit the ideal picture of the benign, self-controlled, ever-poised, well-adjusted, bourgeois citizen. As a consequence, hatred and resentment were generally repressed. Now it is a well-known psychological tendency that when we repress one attitude or emotion, we often counterbalance it by acting or assuming an attitude on the surface which is just the opposite. You may, for example, often find yourself acting especially politely toward the person you dislike. If you are relatively free from anxiety, you may be saying to yourself in this formal politeness, quoting from St. Paul, I treat my enemy well in order to heap coals of fire on his head. But if you are a less secure person who has had to confront more difficult problems in development, you may try to persuade yourself that you love this very person you hate. 
It is not unusual that a person who is excessively dependent upon a dominating mother or father or other authority, for example, will act toward the other as though he loved him to cover up his hatred. Like a boxer in a clinch, he clings to the very one who is the enemy. In real life, one does not get rid of hatred and resentment in this way. One generally displaces the emotions on other people or turns them inward in self-hate. It is thus crucial that we be able to confront our hatred openly, and it is even more essential that we face our resentment, since that is the form hatred generally takes in polite and civilized life. Most people in our society, on looking into themselves, may not be aware of any particular hatred, but they no doubt will find a good deal of resentment. Perhaps the reason that resentment is such a common, chronic, and corrosive emotion in this fourth century of individual competitiveness is that hatred has been so generally suppressed. Furthermore, if we do not confront our hatred and resentment openly, they will tend sooner or later to turn into the one affect which never does anyone any good, namely self-pity. Self-pity is the preserved form of hatred and resentment. One can then nurse his hatred and retain his psychological balance by means of feeling sorry for himself, comforting himself with the thought of what a tough lot has been his, how much he has had to suffer, and refrain from doing anything about it. Friedrich Nietzsche felt very bitterly and profoundly this problem of resentment in the modern period— Indeed, he again speaks from the center of modern man's psychological conflicts, for he, like so many other contemporaneous, sensitive persons, rebelled against the denial of freedom, but never could get fully beyond the stage of rebellion. The son of a Lutheran clergyman who died when he was a boy, brought up in a stultifying atmosphere by relatives, Nietzsche smarted under the constrictive aspects of his German background— but at the same time, he always was in a struggle against it. A very religious man himself in spirit, if not in dogma, he saw the great role played by resentment in conventional morality in his society. He felt that the middle classes were shot through with suppressed resentment, and that it emerged indirectly in the form of morals. He proclaimed that resentment is at the core of our morals— and that Christian love is the mimicry of impotent hatred. Anyone in our day who wishes an illustration of so-called morality motivated by resentment need look no farther than gossip in a small town. Even those who believe Nietzsche's view is one-sided as it in fact is will agree that no one can arrive at real love or morality or freedom until he has frankly confronted and worked through his resentment. Hatred and resentment should be used as motivations to re-establish one's genuine freedom. One will not transform those destructive emotions into constructive ones until he does this. And the first step is to know whom or what one hates. To take for an example people under dictatorial government— the first step in their revolt to regain freedom would be their shifting back their hatred to the dictatorial powers themselves. Hatred and resentment temporarily preserve the person's inner freedom, but sooner or later he must use the hatred to establish his freedom and dignity in reality, else his hatred will destroy himself. The aim, as one person put it in a poem, is to hate in order to win the new. What Freedom is Not We can understand more clearly what freedom is if we first look at what it is not. Freedom is not rebellion. Rebellion is a normal interim move toward freedom. It occurs to some extent when the little child is trying to exercise his muscles of independence through the power to say no. It occurs more clearly when the adolescent is trying to become independent of parents. In adolescence, and possibly in other stages too, the strength of the rebelliousness against what the parents stand for is often excessive because the young person is fighting his own anxiety at stepping out into the world. When parents say don't, 
he often must scream defiance at them because that don't is exactly what he feels the craven side of himself is saying, the side of himself which is tempted to take refuge behind the walls of parental protection. But rebellion is often confused with freedom itself. It becomes a false port in the storm because it gives the rebel a delusive sense of being really independent. The rebel forgets that rebellion always presupposes an outside structure of rules, laws, expectations against which one is rebelling, and one's security, sense of freedom and strength are dependent actually on this external structure. They are borrowed and can be taken away like a bank loan which can be called in at any moment. Psychologically, many persons stop at this stage of rebellion. Their sense of inner moral strength comes only from knowing what moral conventions they do not live up to. They get an oblique sense of conviction by proclaiming their atheism and disbelief. Much of the psychological vitality of the 1920s came from rebellion. This is illustrated in the novels of F. Scott Fitzgerald, D. H. Lawrence, and, to some extent, Sinclair Lewis. It is interesting now when reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise or his other novels which were the Bibles of the emancipated young people of his day to note what a furor is made over kissing a girl or other actions that now impress us as mere peccadilloes. D. H. Lawrence carried on a great crusade in his novel Lady Chatterley's Lover to proclaim the thesis that Lady Chatterley, whose husband had become paralyzed, had the right to take a lover who happened to be a worker on the estate grounds. A novelist writing that novel today would scarcely find it necessary, so little does sexual freedom now have to be argued, to make the husband paralyzed. It was not that the ideas were in themselves unworthy of serious discussion. Ideas like free love, free expression, in bringing up children and so on, it is that they were defined negatively, largely in terms of what one was against. We were against external compulsions on love, against rigidly curtailing the free development of children, and the emphasis, if we take the latter example, was on what the parents must not do. He must not interfere, and, in the extreme forms of the doctrine, the child must be allowed to do anything he wishes— it was not seen that such structureless living actually increased children's anxiety. It also was not seen that the parent must obviously take a good deal of responsibility for the child's actions, and that positive freedom consists of the parents doing this in the context of a genuine respect for the child as a person, actually and potentially, that he give all realistic room for the potentialities of the child to develop, and that he not require the child to falsify his wants and emotions. Those of us who were in college in the late 1920s recall what a sense of power we got from the causes and crusades, from knowing so staunchly what we were rebelling against, be it war or sexual taboos or companionate marriage or booze or prohibition or what not. But now a rebel in that sense would have a hard time getting an audience. H. L. Mencken, the great iconoclast, was the high priest of those years, and it seemed everybody on the campus read him. Who reads him now? Today this kind of rebelling is all rather boring. For when there are no set standards to rebel against, one gets no power from rebelling. It is not that the bank called in the loan— the bank simply collapsed, and no loan had any worth anymore. By the middle of our century, the process of demolishment begun back in the 19th century, a demolishment that is one side of the transformation of standards, has done its work, and we are reaping emptiness and bewilderment. All the sad young men, like those the early F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about, got a sense of potency from kissing a girl— but since that is now routine and gives one no special feeling of power, these are the young men who have had to search within themselves for their potency, and in so many cases have found it lacking.
Since the rebel gets his sense of direction and vitality from attacking the existing standards and mores, he does not have to develop standards of his own. Rebellion acts as a substitute for the more difficult process of struggling through to one's own autonomy, to new beliefs, to the state where one can lay new foundations on which to build. The negative forms of freedom confused freedom with license, and overlooked the fact that freedom is never the opposite to responsibility. Another common error is to confuse freedom with planlessness. Some writers these days argue that if the system of economic laissez-faire, letting everyone do as he wishes, were altered as history marches on, our freedom would vanish with it. The argument of these authors often goes something like this. Freedom is like a living thing. It is indivisible, and if the individual's right to own the means of production is taken away, he no longer has the freedom to earn his living in his own way. Then he can have no freedom at all. Well, if these writers were right, it would indeed be unfortunate. For who then could be free? Not you, nor I, nor anyone else, except a very small group of persons— for in this day of giant industries, only the minutest fraction of citizens can own the means of production anyway. Laissez-faire was a great idea, as we have heard, in earlier centuries. But times change, and almost everyone nowadays earns his living by virtue of belonging to a large group, be it an industry or a university or a labor union. It is a vastly more interdependent world, this one world of our twentieth century, than the world of the entrepreneurs of earlier centuries or of our own pioneer days, and freedom must be found in the context of economic community and the social value of work, not in everyone's setting up his own factory or university. Fortunately, this economic interdependence need not destroy freedom if we keep our perspective. The Pony Express was a great idea also back in the days when sending a letter from coast to coast was an adventure, but certainly we are thankful, complain as we may about mail service these days, that now when we write a letter to a friend on the coast, we don't have to give more than a passing thought to its method of travel. We drop it in the box with an airmail stamp and forget about it. We are free, that is, to devote more time and concern to our message to our friend, our intellectual and spiritual interchange in the letter, because in a world made smaller by specialized communication, we don't have to be so concerned about how the letter gets there. We are more free intellectually and spiritually precisely because we accept our position in economic interdependence with our fellow men. I have often wondered why there is such anxiety and such an outcry that freedom will be lost unless we preserve the old laissez-faire practices. Is not one of the reasons the fact that modern man has so thoroughly surrendered inward psychological and spiritual freedom to the routine of his work and to the mass patterns of social conventions that he feels the only vestige of freedom left to him is the opportunity for economic aggrandizement? Has he made the freedom to compete with his neighbor economically a last remnant of individuality, which therefore must stand for the whole meaning of freedom? That is to say, if the citizen of the suburbs could not buy a new car each year, build a bigger house, and paint it a slightly different color from his neighbors, might he feel that his life would have no purpose, that he would not exist as a person? The great weight placed on competitive laissez-faire freedom seems to me to show how much we have lost a real understanding of freedom. To be sure, freedom is indivisible, and this is precisely why one cannot identify it with a particular economic doctrine or segment of life, least of all a segment of the past. It is a living thing, and its life comes precisely from how the whole person relates himself to the community of his fellow men. Freedom means openness, a readiness to grow. It means being flexible, ready to change for the sake of greater human values. To identify freedom with a given system 
is to deny freedom. It crystallizes freedom and turns it into dogma. To cling to a tradition with the defensive plea that if we lose something that worked well in the past, we will have lost all, neither shows the spirit of freedom nor makes for the future growth of freedom. We shall keep faith with those courageous men, the pioneer industrialists, the men of commerce and the capitalists of the 16th to 19th centuries in the Western world, as well as with the independent frontiersmen of our own country, if we emulate their courage, dare to think boldly as they did, and plan the most effective economic measures for our day as they did for theirs. This book is on psychology rather than economics or sociology, and we touch on the larger picture only because man always lives in a social world, and that world conditions his psychological health. We simply propose that our social and economic ideal be that society which gives the maximum opportunity for each person in it to realize himself, to develop and use his potentialities, and to labor as a human being of dignity, giving to and receiving from his fellow men. The good society is, thus, the one which gives the greatest freedom to its people, freedom defined not negatively and defensively, but positively as the opportunity to realize ever greater human values. It follows that collectivism, as in fascism and communism, is the denial of these values and must be opposed at all costs. But we shall successfully overcome them only as we are devoted to positive ideals which are better, chiefly the building of a society based on a genuine respect for persons and their freedom. What Freedom Is Freedom is man's capacity to take a hand in his own development. It is our capacity to mold ourselves. Freedom is the other side of consciousness of self. If we were not able to be aware of ourselves, we would be pushed along by instinct or the automatic march of history like bees or mastodons. But by our power to be conscious of ourselves, we can call to mind how we acted yesterday or last month, and by learning from these actions, we can influence, even if ever so little, how we act today. And we can picture in imagination some situation tomorrow, say, a dinner date or an appointment for a job or a board of directors meeting, and by turning over in fantasy different alternatives for acting, we can pick the one which will do best for us. Consciousness of self gives us the power to stand outside the rigid chain of stimulus and response, to pause and, by this pause, to throw some weight on either side, to cast some decision about what the response will be. That consciousness of self and freedom go together is shown in the fact that the less self-awareness a person has, the more he is unfree. That is to say, the more he is controlled by inhibitions, repressions, childhood conditionings which he has consciously forgotten, but which still drive him unconsciously, the more he is pushed by forces over which he has no control. When persons first come for psychotherapeutic help, for example, they generally complain that they are driven in any number of ways. They have sudden anxieties or fears or are blocked in studying or working without any appropriate reason. They are unfree, that is, bound and pushed by unconscious patterns. It may be after some months of psychotherapeutic work, little changes begin to appear. The person begins to recall his dreams regularly, or in one session he takes the initiative in stating that he wants to change the subject on hand and get some help on a different problem. Or one day he can say that he felt angry when the therapist said such and such, or he is able to cry when previously he never could feel much of anything, or suddenly he laughs with spontaneity and wholeheartedness, or is able to state he doesn't like Mary with whom he has been conventional friends for years, but does like Carolyn. In such ways, slight as they may seem, 
His emerging self-awareness goes hand in hand with his enlarging power to direct his own life. As the person gains more consciousness of self, his range of choice and his freedom proportionately increase. Freedom is cumulative. One choice made with an element of freedom makes greater freedom possible for the next choice. Each exercise of freedom enlarges the circumference of the circle of one's self. We do not mean to imply that there are not an infinite number of deterministic influences in anyone's life. If you wished to argue that we are determined by our bodies, by our economic situation, by the fact that we happened to be born into the twentieth century in America, and so on, I would agree with you, and I would add many more ways in which we are psychologically determined, particularly by tendencies of which we are unconscious. But no matter how much one argues for the deterministic viewpoint, he still must grant that there is a margin in which the alive human being can be aware of what is determining him. And even if only in a very minute way to begin with, he can have some say in how he will react to the deterministic factors. Freedom is thus shown in how we relate to the deterministic realities of life. If you set out to write a sonnet, you run up against all kinds of recalcitrant realities in the laws of rhyme and scanning, and in the necessity of fitting words together. Or, if you build a house, you confront all kinds of determining elements in bricks and mortar and lumber. It is essential that you know your material and accept its limits. But what you say in the sonnet, as Alfred Adler used to emphasize, is uniquely yours. The pattern and the style in which you build your house are products of how you, with an element of freedom, use the reality of the given materials. The arguments of freedom versus determinism are on a false basis, just as it is false to think of freedom as a kind of isolated electric button called free will. Freedom is shown in according one's life with realities, realities as simple as the needs for rest and food or as ultimate as death. Meister Eckhart expressed this approach to freedom in one of his astute psychological counsels, when you are thwarted, it is your own attitude that is out of order. Freedom is involved when we accept the realities not by blind necessity, but by choice. This means that the acceptance of limitations need not at all be a giving up, but can and should be a constructive act of freedom. And it may well be that such a choice will have more creative results for the person than if he had not had to struggle against any limitation whatever. The man who is devoted to freedom does not waste time fighting reality. Instead, as Kierkegaard remarked, he extols reality. Let us take as an illustration a situation in which people are very much controlled, namely when they are sick with a disease like tuberculosis. In almost every action they are rigidly conditioned by the facts that they are in a sanatorium under a strict regime, have to rest such and such time, can walk only fifteen minutes a day, and so on. But there is all the difference in the world in how persons relate to the reality of the disease. Some give up and literally invite their own deaths. Others do what they are supposed to do, but they continually resent the fact that nature or God has given them such a disease, and though they outwardly obey, they inwardly rebel against the rules. These patients generally don't die, but neither do they get well. Like rebels in any area in life, they remain on a plateau perpetually marking time. Other patients, however, frankly confront the fact that they are very seriously ill. They let this tragic fact sink into consciousness through plentiful hours of contemplation as they lie in beds on the sanatorium porch. They seek in their consciousness of self to understand what was wrong in their lives beforehand that they should have succumbed to the illness. They use the cruelly deterministic fact of being sick as an avenue to new self-knowledge. These are the patients who can best choose and affirm the methods and the self-discipline, 
which can never be put into rules but vary from day to day, which will bring them victoriously through the disease. They are the ones who not only achieve physical health, but who also are ultimately enlarged, enriched, and strengthened by the experience of having had the disease. They affirm their elemental freedom to know and to mold deterministic events. They meet a severely deterministic fact with freedom. It is doubtful whether anyone really achieves health who does not responsibly choose to be healthy, and whoever does so choose becomes more integrated as a person by virtue of having had a disease. Through his power to survey his life, man can transcend the immediate events which determine him. Whether he has tuberculosis or is a slave like the Roman philosopher Epictetus, or a prisoner condemned to death, he can still in his freedom choose how he will relate to these facts. And how he relates to a merciless, realistic fact like death can be more important for him than the fact of death itself. Freedom is most dramatically illustrated in the heroic actions, like Socrates' decision to drink the hemlock rather than compromise. But even more significant is the undramatic, steady, day-to-day -day exercise of freedom on the part of any person developing toward psychological and spiritual integration in a distraught society like our own. Thus, freedom is not just the matter of saying yes or no to a specific decision. It is the power to mold and create ourselves. Freedom is the capacity, to use Nietzsche's phrase, to become what we truly are. Freedom and Structure Freedom never occurs in a vacuum. It is not anarchy. Earlier in this book we pointed out how the self-consciousness of the child is born in the structure of his relations with his parents, and we emphasized that the psychological freedom of the human being develops not as though he were a Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, but in continual interaction with the other significant persons in his world. Freedom does not mean trying to live in isolation— it does mean that when one is able to confront his isolation, he is able consciously to choose to act with some responsibility in the structure of his relations with the world, especially the world of other persons around him. The absurd results which can occur when the structure is not adequately emphasized are seen in some of the writings of the leader of French existentialism, Jean-Paul Sartre. The chief character in Sartre's novel, Age of Reason, apparently being portrayed as acting in freedom, actually moves along in whim and indecision, his actions motivated by the nightly recurrence of sexual desire, by his mistress's expectations of him, and by other accidents.